President Dr. Celia Reyes for the opening remarks. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. So we're very pleased that um, you're here this afternoon um, to hear about the important presentations on reforms in the education sector. So um, just recently, the country's education system made headlines with the release of the results of the 2018 um, Program for International Student Assessment, or more popularly known as PISA. According to the report, the Philippines ranked low in reading, mathematics, and science, all very important uh, subjects. While this was the first time the Philippines joined PISA, we have been getting poor marks in terms of the quality of our education system in the global index. In the 2017 Global Innovation Index, the Philippines ranked 113th out of 127 countries in the education category. Then in 2018, we placed 105th out of 126 countries. So the past decade saw reforms in the country's education system in a bid to improve its overall performance. Um, laws have been passed, um, policies have been put in place, and programs have been implemented. Through this public seminar, we aim to contribute to the ongoing discussions by presenting our assessments of the major reforms in our education sector. We hope to shed light on whether or not these reforms are working and how we can still enhance um, some of this, particularly because some of these reforms are actually very new. This afternoon, uh, we're very honored to have uh, four interesting and relevant studies. The first paper, which will be presented by our um, expert on education, our senior research fellow, Aniceto Orbeta, will focus on the early assessment of the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act or RA 1093-1's first year of implementation. In fact, he just came from the Senate, so he traveled uh, all the way from Pasay um, to here, because um, he attended uh, the committee hearing on, on education. So um, Dr. Orbeta will look at the law's program design and objectives, as well as the perception and experiences of key stakeholders and implementers. The second paper will be presented by one of our consultants and co-author of the study, Melba Chutor, and she will discuss the results of the fourth Philippine Graduate Tracer Survey, which collects data on the graduate's college experience, including skills learned, quality of education, and how it relates to employability. Um, the third paper to be presented by Ms. Karen Brillantes, um, another PIDS consultant and co-author of the study, will provide the results of the assessment done on the implementation of the senior high school program and identify best practices, issues, and areas for improvement, particularly on the um, program service delivery and utilization and program organization. And um, the fourth uh, paper, so you know that we have really a very jam-packed program this afternoon, will be discussed by Ms. Jennifer Monhe, um, PIDS consultant and co-author of the study, to show us the outcome of the evaluation done on the implementation of the mother tongue-based multilingual education program, which mandates the use of the mother tongue as medium of instruction during the first four years of primary education. So you know, I, I think just uh, uh, looking at the, the program today, that there have been um, a lot of reforms, a lot of new programs being implemented. And we hope that through this public seminar, we'll be able to contribute to the ongoing and future efforts of various sectors aimed at improving the quality of education in the country. So whereas before we were more, in, um, I, I think, focused on improving access to education, now it has focused to um, improving the quality of education. So we look forward to hearing your insights during the open forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mamsel. Our first presenter is a senior research fellow here at PIDS. He has a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines and a postdoctoral degree from the uh, Harvard University. He is also a professorial lecturer at the University of the Philippines School of Economics. He is an economist 
specializing in education and labor market issues, applied um, economic modeling, impact evaluation, social sector issues, demographic economics, and information and, and in information and communication technologies. He has developed various economic, demographic, and empirical household decision models on schooling, labor supply, health and nutrition and savings. He served as a consultant to the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, Australian Agency for International Development, International Labor Organization, and Millennium Challenge Corporation. He is also he also served as a principal investigator at the Innovations for Poverty Action. He is a lifetime member of the Philippine Economic Society and a member of the American Economic Society. Friends, I now give the floor to Dr. Aniseta Orbeta. Uh, apologies, I cannot stand for long. I have problems with my feet. Uh, uh, the, the study, uh, the four studies that we have been doing for the past two years is, is you know, this, as the president mentioned, is covering many of the initiatives in the education sector. This first one is really on, on uh, uh, the RA 1093. And uh, as you know, it's just uh, implemented, and uh, uh, the, we tried our very best to get information that is useful for to provide us uh, some kind of an assessment on on how it, uh, it's going in the first year of this implementation. I'm not the only one doing this. Uh, the president is part of the study team, and and uh, Ms. Uh, Ortiz, and Ms. Pilad, and Ms. Arauz. Uh, Okay, so this is the background, uh, the outline. I should uh, be following in the very standard, standard. Uh, and we just go through. I have supposed to be doing this in 20 minutes. And it's about what 40 slides, so two slides per. So the objective is to really click insights and to give us. I think the the board has the board of the PIDS has asked us to give. Uh, uh, and uh, some kind of an update of what's happening to this. Uh, this is a very controversial law. Uh, as you may know, in the discussion, the economic team was, was against the law, but the president decided to push through with the law. So that's, 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 that's the background. So we're trying to know how it's implemented, much and so insights of the, and, and the, the study and the document, the actual implementation, is uh, uh, to try to check on the beneficiary targeting and um, uh, the resource inputs for the program and procedurals, matters, and how the, the program is implemented. Of course, the main view is by trying to find out what can be, how it can be done to, to improve implementation. That's, that's the, always the objective of many of the PIDS studies. What can we recommend to uh, better, uh, for the program to better achieve its objectives? So in the assessment, always uh, in process, we call this process assessment, we always look at this in terms of three things. One is the assessment of the program theory, is the theory uh, sound, plausible, and is it uh, objectives really uh, uh, achievable? And as, uh, the next one is uh, uh, service delivery, and, and how, how is it being utilized by supposedly target beneficiaries? And the assessment of the support of the program. So that's basically the three things that we ask in any of the process evaluation that we do. So policy background, this is the, if you are not uh, very keen on the, on the uh, student at STUFAPS, Student Financial Assistance Program. Uh, in 2010, there are only uh, 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 the STUFAPS on, on, on many tar supposedly targeted for the poor and all of that. But in, in in 2012, there was a uh, there was a very important in innovation, which is actually targets the four piece families with with high school graduates, providing them with advance in aid. And this is a very important program because the first time this is the pro first time that a program finan provides uh, uh, living allowance besides the tuition. So this is the biggest and the most ambitious uh, in terms of allowance. And I said uh, there was only an even an, an issue whether this program. Uh, is uh, set in the right tone given that the full scholarships of the other program only gives half of the what's given here. So, uh, which we like because if you, we said that if you want to target the poor, 
then you give them full amount. It cannot be just tuition because uh, uh, they have to leave house and, 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 and to, to avail of tertiary education. That's essentially the, uh, the, what the program. And uh, towards the discussions of that, we were trying to, in 2015, there was a law that was passed uh, called Unifast Law. Essentially, that, rationali uh, that rationalizes uh, how do you finance students. So basically, we have three things there. In principle, we have uh, we have a uh, uh, we have scholarships for the brightest and grants in aid for the poor, which is basically the prototype of that is this GPPPA and loans for everybody else. So that's that's what the law says. Except that the law has never been uh, given funding, so it was just right principles with no funding. And uh, in twenty seventeen. Here comes the free tuition law. Free tuition, law, free tuition is a very popular uh, policy. Uh, we move against it because it actually torpedoes the, the initial initiative of, of uh, scholarship for the brightest, grants in aid for the poor. And because the free tuition law doesn't, <coughs> so long as you are, you, are, you, are, uh, you are admitted to a state university and colleges, you get free tuition, regardless of your income. So what we said that we don't have that kind of money. So, so we are always been saying that it should be targeted if you want to uh, increase access, you target it for the poor. That's the that's the prison law and the implementation of that uh, in 2017 when law was provided, uh, came out with uh, four components. One is the free tuition for the public education, free t as, uh, together with that free technical vocational education as well, and tertiary education subsidy. This is for the private school intended for the poor in private schools and student loans program. So there was, uh, and uh, I will try to describe, this is the law that we are trying to assess. Okay, so this is the objectives of the law is in increased participation rate, that's one of course, but uh, uh, it says that it gives equal opportunity to quality tertiary education. So that's, those are the key terms, equal quality and quality. And priority students who are academically able and who come from poor families, that's the other objective. Uh, supposedly optimizing utilization of government resources. So inadequate guidance and uh, provide adequate guidance and incentives to and channeling Filipinos to their career choices. So that, 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 those, are, those are the principles that the law is supposedly impl uh, implementing. And complementary roles for public and private. So uh, I think you, you will find out that it, the law itself, uh, as it's designed, is a mixed bag. Uh, it's, it's one contradicting with the other. With the other. Uh, as we'll s as this is what I've said already, this is the components of the law. So the universal uh, access to quality education supposedly uh, uh, embodied in two things, the free tuition for issues and LUs and, and other fees and state-run TVI, so that's the other one. So uh, we're not able actually to look at this, this other part. We only look at the, the higher <coughs> education part. Uh, for the tertiary education subsidy, we're able to uh, interview some of the, st uh, of the private schools, but this is still the very much, much, late, much, much uh, later in implementation. So you have tuition, uh, the TES one is tuition and other school fees in private high schools and, and LG operated TVIs and all allowance for books, supplies, transportation and uh, so this is basically uh, a for the tier two this is basically trying to adapt the GPPA where you provide uh, uh, allowances Roman board so it adapts that one because we post that if you are targeting the poor that should be part of the program you cannot just give them vision because that will not work and there is a special uh, attention for uh, children with disability and even uh, assistance for taking uh, professional licensure examinations, those are added uh, for the TES, okay? For the student loan program, uh, there are two kinds. You have a short term, like for example, students uh, who cannot pay for the tuition have to take a loan, but they have to pay for the loan within the sem or the semester or year uh, within the university. That's a very common loan that's been taken by students. Then you have, uh, 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 ex at ex review of expenses for uh, for for licensure examination. So that's 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 the other thing that uh, and the, uh, I should say the long term loan. Of course, that we know that we have to pay off for, for the whole program, uh, uh, complete, completing the program. So that uh, 
So let us try to describe, uh, describe the, the whole education system in a nutshell. So basically we have 88% uh, in terms of HEIs, 88% are private, 5% are ECUCs, and 6% are EUCs and one are other public. So that's basically the distribution. Here's the enrollment. Enrollment rate, uh, there's a problem actually, we have been citing this uh, problem in the enro enrollment data. CHED data tells us that there is, uh, uh, of course this is a longer series. From 1994, seven, uh, the share of pri private is, is, uh, is 79, uh, going down to 53 by, by, about, by about last year. And the public's rising from 21 to 47. That's the, that's the CHED data. Uh, you will find out that uh, the share from the APIs, the household survey data, is entirely different. It's more like more public than private. The only thing that is consistent in this data set is that the share of the private sector is declining. But in terms of levels, they are not agreeing. Uh, I don't know what's the, what's the uh, we cannot resolve the issues about this, uh, why this is inconsistent. Okay. So the other thing that I'd like to mention that before uh, 2014 to 2015, the uh, recipients of student financial assistance programs are very, very low proportion of total enrollments, about 2%, 3%. In 2014, uh, when the PDAF was rendered unconstitutional, it jumped because all those PDAF funded scholarships went to CHED. So that's basically how it, uh, how it jumped to from 60, 70,000 students to 300,000, so almost 400,000 students in 200. That's basically the story of that. that, that, that that's the, the proportion of, um, of, of students uh, getting uh, some form of uh, student financial assistance. Okay, so what did uh, we do in the methodology? Uh, this is a, a qual mostly qualitative uh, plus the, the uh, 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 administrative data assessment which I've, I've seen to you. This is supposedly the, the uh, uh, what we thought as the theory of change to the program. Essentially, the final outcomes are higher graduation rates and higher employment rates. Um, that's that's the for any education system. That's the uh, that's the whole point. I think we can. Uh, uh, that's not too much. So I don't I don't know if you bring up an issue here, but that's the way we arrange it, and we try to look at some of the components of this in the assessment. Okay, so for data collection, we used uh, desk review of whatever, uh, as I've said, there are uh, limited data, and sometimes data are inconsistent even from two different sources. We, do the, we did key informat entry. This is the way we quickly uh, assess what the implementers are feeling about the program, and uh, we also collect administrative data from CHED and wherever and from uh, national surveys. But the other thing that we did, because we did, there was no data readily available that's uh, updated enough, we have to do our own live survey for, our, for some uh, selected uh, higher education institutions, but uh, most uh, some of them are friends of the president. And, and basically we did our own data collection just to get you know, some, some idea on what, what's happening to enrollment? That's very clearly the issue. Okay, so this is the finally uh, after the about seven months of doing this, we about we were able to talk to 18 organizations, uh, 13 ECIs, universities, one university, uh, four university associations, one key stakeholders, and this is distribution across uh, the ge geography. Okay, the results. So. In terms of program logic, this is the first uh, item. The, the understanding of the law is, seems to be, uh, everybody seems to understand what the law is all about. Uh, that's provide greater access to quality tertiary education. Okay, so that's the, everybody have that. Then, but there are other, uh, uh, when you ask them about are these objectives realistic and achievable, uh, uh, the respondents uh, generally believe that the objectives of the law are accept, uh, of to increase access is achievable and realistic. Uh, it is dependent upon ever whether we can sustain the budget. As we all know, uh, 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 it's not easy to be uh, for how many billions of pesos to be recurring in the national budget. So from other, uh, from the others noted that the lower income classes may be disadvantaged for the same reason that maybe the you need to, if your, uh, the agreement was 
public schools will not increase the number of seats, okay? We maintain without the approval of chair. That's the, the so uh, that means that everyone has to compete for those free seats, uh, free tuition seats. So if you have to compete, uh, how do you compete? You compete according to academic performance. And you think the low and in lower income people will be able to do that against the more advantaged uh, colleagues. So that's, that's basically that the people feel that uh, maybe the uh, lower income will be at a disadvantage, uh, which actually torpedoes the idea that it gives them ac the, the poor access with this kind of law. Okay. So here's the some assessment uh, achievable uh, is the issue of equity. So you, you can find uh, this is the data from APIS. So from 2011 and 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 I think the second uh, income quintile is well represented. It's about 20 percent, but the bottom uh, there's a little bit of increase in in in. in uh, I don't know if that will will be sustained, but the will you know the bottom twenty is not rep uh, well represented in, in in the enrollment. So that's 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 the uh, the uh, what you can get from the data. Uh, uh, for the, 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 this is for the pu this is for the public uh, universities. I I, I, I should say. Uh, um, then for the private, of course, that's uh, sorry. Private, of course, that's even lower. Uh, uh, the proportions of, of the poor uh, bottom twenty uh, four uh, 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 bottom forty is even lower, uh, and private is understandable. Okay, so that, that's uh, so we're uh, watching these these proportions as we go along in, in the implementation of the law, assuming that we get the same. Okay, so. Uh, so some of the respondents were concerned that, that the, the uh, objective of maintaining and improving quality of education will might be hampered. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, that's the the idea. And the amount of budget to operationalize the four components of the law uh, is to perceived to be critical uh, in intent in, in achieving the objectives. So it depends upon can we sustain the budget allocation that the program requires. Is that are there, uh, we asked them, are there better approaches to achieve the same objective? Some suggested that there may be b better objectives of, of, of the law, uh, obtaining the objectives of the law. One, so improve the invest in public education to increase the chances of the low income. Uh, uh, so basically, it's more like uh, encourage targeting because the next one says that those who can pay are encouraged to pay. There are actually people uh, who are willing to pay for their education. And so, lo and behold, the government says we pay for you. So that's that's the so <coughs> decentralize the assessment of potential beneficiaries. And, some, and there's uh, I think one of the slow moving uh, and problem prone areas is the implementation of the TES because it requires targeting, it requires uh, identification of the re, uh, of the right beneficiaries, and realign the funds from the free uh, free tuition part to the TES if we have to increase the the uh, the access of the poor and and uh, of course the for the other functions with universities there might be that all money for tertiary education will go into free tuition so maybe the other function with universities might suffer uh, in the process and for the third second component uh, the on service delivery and utilization the insights of the guidelines uh, says uh, the the guidelines were uh, delayed, in, uh, delayed. So delay guidelines mean delayed implementation because nobody can move without the guidelines. And some were very clear and uh, not very clear and incomplete. So it somehow the guidelines comes in installment. Ma majority of the respondents, both public, noted that most of the guidelines were released at very tight schedules and some and and and, and uh, of course you have enrollment. Targets and uh, no, no, no mean dates, and I should say that, and uh, and the students cannot meet the requirements right away. So when you cannot meet the requirement, you cannot get the 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 uh, benef benefits. Okay. Now all the respondents realize that these issues and challenges of the implementations are are birthing based. We're just the first year, so we we grant that 
Uh, these are issues of a uh, new program, a very large program. So these are birthing pains. Hopefully we can address this. So that's, 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 the, that's the general consensus of the respondents. Uh, the problems with reimbursement and miscellaneous fees, uh, that, uh, what constitutes that what are reimbursable fees is also an issue. It's not very clear. And uh, so, the, so what, co uh, what, what will constitute part of the free tuition, and because it's not tuition, but also fees. That's not clear, and and and, that's, and and hampered implementation as well. And then there was uh, controversy on what should be covered. All respondents also acknowledge that the issues and the challenges of implementations are part of the, the same thing that that they said. So we, they are forgiving. Uh, the yeah, the suffer the the voice their their uh, their uh, their issues, but they are forgiving at, at this point. Uh, of course. Uh, 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 that's how the way we look at uh, the, the way what this, what they tell us. So the Unifans noted that there are uh, uh, they were able to convene uh, resources uh, that they were able to convene resources uh, from technical groups, but there there is a lack of technical. The, I think the Unifas board has mentioned that the lack the not, not just the number of the personnel but the technical capacity. They have lacked both. Uh, I think there was an issue that maybe uh, just mentioned sometime that they have the uh, items in their organizations, but those items are, ne are not filled. All personnel are contractual. That's 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 the and uh, uh, besides that, the, the technical capacity of, of handling a very large program is is an issue. Even that, even they they the, the have mentioned that. Okay, so. In terms of allocation, is the the uh, gives you all the idea of the process. Forty percent is in uh, uh, is in the free higher education, meaning free tuition. F another forty uh, percent is in the TES. So seven billion goes to uh, 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 free technical and vocational education. I think this should be looked at because uh, TESD has been implementing only uh, like two billion size programs. This is three times their size in terms of, of program. So I don't know how they will deliver this. Somebody has to look at it or, uh, and how, how it was delivered. We, we, we were not able to do that. And one billion for, for loans. So this is the, uh, this is the prioritization of the uh, total amount of, uh, I forget the number, but that's. that's the okay, so. Status of implementation as of December uh, 2019 is this. Uh, the number of beneficiaries about uh, for free tuition, uh, this is 13.5 uh, uh, for uh, issues, uh, 1.4 for, for LUCs. That's, that's the, so it's all the, almost the consumed the amount. Uh, for uh, uh, the, the, uh, I think the, the major issues is in, in, in TES implementation because it's targeted. It's not as uh, it is more difficult than the other one. I mean, just because when you are when you are in, uh, admitted to the to the SUC, you get the subsidy. But here you have to identify the uh, up to the I think the middle of last year we were even asked to help them identify more uh, beneficiaries because there are a lot of slots that's remaining uh, in the in the in the program are not not being used so uh, there's somehow issues in identifying the 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 beneficiaries so there's also a a confusion because the law says listahanan and it doesn't uh, somehow distinguish between being in the listahanan and being eligible for four piece actually i think the intention of the law is for four piece beneficiaries if you are a purpose beneficiary, you get, uh, and you are enrolled in a private university, you are, uh, you're the first priority for the TES. But the loss is listahanan. It doesn't say that liberal for, for peace. So that created a confusion. There are some, and uh, Unifas didn't somehow and get that well in terms of the implementation. So they have, but of course, the, when they would implemented it, they asked DSW to give them the list. About the list, of course, DSW to give them the, not the list of Hanan, but the list of four piece beneficiaries, uh, households to have. Uh, so that created a, a problem as well. And uh, this, 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 this is the performance for, 
for the TES or for the SGPPA who are continuing students is the, the priority uh, the beneficiaries. Then, uh, uh, the other set of, that's about uh, what, uh, 13, 14,000. Then you have, there's this uh, private schools where there is no SUCs. Remember that if there is an SUC, you can go on as front. So you have, uh, if you have in an area where there's an SUC, the, the private school supposedly are the priority of students of private schools in those areas are also priority. It's about 71,000, 71,000 students in December. And listahan and two, this is the uh, next about 147, uh, 40, 48,000. Then grantees again, additional, this is I think the second round. So you have unfilled slots and all of that. So about 300,000 uh, uh, students. Uh, and uh, we have four PWDs and uh, uh, those with uh, graduating with in board courses. So that's the other group of, of uh, grantees for the TES. Uh, remember, TS for private schools. So uh, there's an issue over the where the funds should be launched. That's that's one of the things. And for Billy and the, uh, the respondents did not want that to undergo the uh, cumbersome supposedly billing process. That's the the, the idea. You build the ch uh, you build ched for for those students, and uh, it's HCI that uh, uh, prefer that they, they be given flexibility in terms of where to spend because uh, it. It depends upon where it will be will come in and whether they can spend it or not. Particularly for public uh, universities where there are TES. Uh, uh, also, we 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 one of the things that we argued is that the poor students are not only in public uh, private universities; they are also in private public universities. So, since they are only getting tuition in 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 uh, private. Uh, 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 public universities, maybe they should be eligible also for the uh, living allowance part. Uh, uh, so the satisfactions we said is uh, of the implementation is mixed. Some said that they are satisfied with the program. Uh, I just stated the satisfactions implementation of the program, particularly on the billing. So basically, it's about uh, who are uh, when the when the students are, are actually identified, the, the trying to reimburse for the students is, is as difficult. Of course, as I've said, this is the first year of implementation, we expect all of us, and, and people are somewhat forgiving that this, that's the case. Okay, uh, so in program organization, we ask them about whether, do you have to adjust your systems in order to accommodate the, the program? And many say that no, they don't. Uh, we, uh, I think uh, that kind of, of, uh, nah, of uh, Maybe we are wait and see attitudes, or maybe they think that maybe this this is not a long term program anyway. We don't have to rearrange our system. So basic. So both the public and, and private HCIs mentioned that they will be maintaining the quality of education. That's the that's the that's the uh, uh, they will maintain the admission standards. That means that they not waive uh, even if you are eligible for that. They will not waive you, you pass, uh, which we were grateful. You have to pass the admission requirements of the university. Public universities means adjusting higher to higher demand, so that's basically uh, that, that's actually the that the the influx of uh, of more students going to public universities, and, and that's that's the that's what what we expect, and uh, I, I hope that the public universities will maintain their, their quality standards in terms of admissions, meaning that uh, we are sh making sure that the students will finish their program uh, uh, when they enter the, enter the university, not just avail of the free tuition. Which the, uh, they said that the associations were heavily consulted. And uh, the other thing that we mentioned, that this is very common, I already mentioned, I think I mentioned it in the Senate hearing today, that uh, we all have good intentions, but we never really check whether those intentions are, are achieved or not by our programs. We don't invest on doing that. We just, uh, uh, the only thing that, uh, so the, uh, the same so this, the same for this program, there's no really dedicated monitoring system that will tell us what's happening. That's why it's very difficult to find a uh, comprehensive data set that will tell us what's happened. So the only thing that, as I've said, uh, you have to use the influence of our president to get to presidents of universities just to get data. So, that's, 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 so there's no real, 
program as big as this, or even in the other programs that have, I'll, I'll, be uh, that I'll mention earlier, monitoring is very poor. Um, you just said that because you've done it, expect it to happen, something. You never really check what happened in, on, on the ground. That's which is a very, uh, uh, which is a very big assumption to make. Okay, so let's try to analyze, we try to analyze what's the impact on enrollment. This is a very important thing because it said this access is the one. Some public universities have a higher number of applicants and enrollees, so that's, that, there's, that, that's one of the uh, private noted negative impact on their enrollment, which is also expected, and, 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 and are concerned about the potential negative impact on the future. It's, it's actually a, no one's way that uh, if all the brighter students go to public universities, the only thing that's left for private universities are the, uh, are the less able ones, because they will would like to go to public university where tuition is free. So the other respondents uh, are skeptical. They said that uh, pre pe people prefer, uh, have preference over public over private, so they will always go to wherever they prefer. That's, that's one view as, as well. So those are the views that we got in the field. Okay, so what's the data? So this is the enrollment, total enrollment in, in from, from CHED. So of course we, we have a, a decline in enrollment uh, because of the senior high school implementation. And uh, so that's, so it, it created a rebound a little bit from 2018 to 29, and the pattern that we are getting is that the public universities are uh, 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 getting the, the previous enrollment better than the private universities. So the slow in coming in private universities. So that's that's what we actually observe. This is the uh, uh, first year. This is the total enrollment. This is the first year enrollment from the universities that we that we are able to to uh, to get. It's very difficult to get the just data on first year enrollment. So we use the data from PIDS online survey, and this is the pattern. So you see that the jump back of the public sector is faster than the private sector, which is to be, so the both of them uh, are, are regaining their enrollment, but not as, as uh, the uh, pri public sector is regaining a little better than them. Okay, so uh, the in summary, we said that the respondents are uh, have a good understanding of the intentions of the law, although the, uh, uh, there is mixed opinion on whether these, these objectives are realistic or achievable. That's, that's the, that's the uh, for service deliberatization, I mean, the main issue is regarding the uh, utilization and, and, and uh, of the funds and lack of, of clear guidelines. That's, that's the, uh, and they said that the people are forgiving and said that these are birthing pains and hopefully it will go away in, in the next few years. So that's, that's, that's the general mode of the people. And the main implementer of the program, the UNIFAST, cited lack both personnel and, and, and capacity. So that's, that's, that's what the, so you have entrusting a very big program to an uh, understaffed uh, 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 office. And the plant line implementers uh, that di did not require major adjustments as yet. Yes, uh, I don't know how, how to interpret that, but that's what they're saying. They don't have to re, uh, reassemble their uh, systems in order to, to, to accommodate the program. And uh, the enrollment, as we, as we expected, are, are, are at the, have declined because of senior high school and it's rebound and the, be the, the <coughs> public schools are, are, are uh, better able to gain the their previous enrollment than the private schools. So if you would look at that to the trend of declining uh, private school shares in enrollment, that should be, uh, that would even widen the gap. Uh, I, I think that's, that explains the, uh, the data that we get from APIS. There's a lar very large jump in the share of the public universities. So uh, the first, of course, is that uh, in any program, uh, if you want to know what's happening, we should have a, mon a very clear monitoring system. We just, we should not uh, trust that our intentions will be, will be achieved by themselves. Uh, I, I have a very uh, nice parody for this. Uh, we said that uh, in God we trust. Everybody else should bring data. So th that's 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 first one. Uh, Leverage the subsidy to promote higher, that's the other thing that we were, hopefully we are spending a lot of money here and we can use it to, to promote quality. So one of the things that we should not be very loose in giving subsidy, but we should 
try to target subsidy to improve quality of education. We already have problems in, sub in, 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 in our uh, higher education system. We know that we c our passing rates in, po in professional board exams is always 40%, never gone far from that proportion. So 60% of our graduates cannot practice, of those who are board uh, cannot practice their professions. Uh, look, uh, ways for Im the Im to promote compliance and quality standards, if we, if we said it's just access but quality as well, then we have to make that uh, 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 the compliance and quality standards to be uh, important. Uh, the issues and issues have to be really monitored whether they, they keep on the promise of, uh, of not going beyond their, uh, it is to their advantage that they will go beyond their capacities because they are just reimbursed, right? So that's, so there is a motivation for doing that. They promise that they will not increase the number of seats unless approved by CHED. So we should monitor whether that's, that's, that's really uh, um, followed or not. Uh, we should uh, help uh, Unifast do its job by, by providing uh, the correct organizational support. You cannot just hope that they will do their jobs well when they are understaffed. And uh, we don't even know the, quali the, the, the capacity. Uh, they express already the need for capacity. And uh, uh, for all of this, and, and, and the, uh, we, we should uh, maximize use of technology to, 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 to help us uh, monitor this uh, very big program, very important program, and we're spending a lot of money. Uh, we should be open. Uh, if we are seeing that the, uh, that the program uh, is, is not achieving the equity objective, we should be open to redesigning the program. Uh, uh, in terms, for instance, that uh, maybe we should encourage some more people who are really willing to pay. As I've said, that's the people in private, uh, in issues is who are used, uh, who, who used to be paying tuition, actually uh, do it in their own volition. Why, why do we refuse that kind of money? So if the encourage the opt out if that can be encouraged, but I don't know, maybe we should resign now uh, if, if we see, I, which we, uh, many people are expecting that this would uh, be working against equity. Uh, so the, the TES is a good program, but it all depends on whether we target uh, it correctly or not, because that's, that's the intention of the program, to give access to uh, poor uh, students. So, but if you don't target, if you don't hit them, then uh, that's, that would, there goes the, the, the intention. Aim to, uh, if you have guidelines on a little bit more, and hopefully as I've said, we, by next few years, we will stabilize the implementation of the program and see really what, what, what's happening, I think. Uh, the other issue on miscellaneous fees, what should be covered by the tuition and miscellaneous fees, uh, that should be clarified. Uh, the misconception about the targeting and the listahana. Listahana is not all poor people, but uh, only the Pantawid beneficiaries are poor, supposedly poor people. Um, uh, calibrate the timing, so basically this timing and, and of the uh, deadlines and all that for implementation. Thank you very much. Oi. Thank you so much for that uh, very comprehensive presentation, Dr. Orbeta. Our next speaker is a development economist who works on issues such as poverty, agrarian reform, and social protection. She developed the, the DARS uh, monitoring system for farmer-assisted organizations and is currently working with the United Nations Development Program on a local SDG monitoring and disaster management database. She has also worked with the World Bank and Development Alternatives Incorporated to analyze the impact of tax incentives. She undertook various research management roles for the Philippine Center for Economic Development, the National Anti-Poverty Commission, and the Social Weather Stations. She finished her Master in Development Economics at the UP School of Economics in Diliman and Bachelor of Arts in Political Science in UP Manila. Friends, I now give you Ms. Melba Tutor. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. So I will discuss 
the results from the fourth nationwide graduate tracer study. So a graduate tracer study tries to find out the results of uh, higher education on outcomes such as employment with the end in view of improving the provision of higher education. Yeah. So I will discuss the research questions, the framework that we used for the analysis, methodology, and some results. So because of the time constraint, we just selected some key findings with the hope of picking your interest to look up the full report that you can download from the PIDS website. So we are still accepting comments on that. Okay, so the research questions, you want to find out how was their college life, basically. And then how was their post-college life? in terms of employment, um, citizenship, and overall life satisfaction. And we also tried to do a little bit of analysis on what they think about job education mismatch, which is a key issue in higher education. And then we tried to relate or find some, um, find some interesting um, relationship between college experience and post-college experience. For instance, if you recall that you have a better college experience, do you tend to be the one with better employment outcomes? So, to the extent that we can from the data. So the framework is, so we think that higher education or deciding to take up college is not an individual decision, but a household decision. And it's influenced by many factors, such as your parents' education, your sex, your motives and abilities, and of course, your prior education from preschool to uh, senior high. Those are all, those all factor in when, when you make a decision as a family, whether you go to college or not. And if you decide to go to college, then your experience will be mostly determined by the environment provided by your uh, higher education institution. So the quality of the curriculum, the faculty, the services and the facilities of the school. And so your pre-college life and your college life all determine to a great extent your uh, post-college experience. And in this particular study, we looked at labor force participation, citizenship formation, and uh, life satisfaction. So all these are influenced by, of course, labor market conditions and sociocultural uh, Con conditions as well. So this is our framework. Yeah. So methodology, so the study covers graduates from 2009 to 2011. So it took a long time to release the results because of um, substantial implementation and procurement um, issues. But we, see, we hope that this is still relevant for us. So it's representative at the regional level with public and private um, HEI disaggregation. The total sample size is 35,297. So that's the biggest so far of all the GTS. So the methodology is face-to-face -face interview <coughs> using a structured questionnaire. So this GTS is actually uh, has the most uh, comprehensive questionnaire so far of all the GTS. So it included not just personal and family background, college experience and work experience, but we also included questions on social political participation and life satisfaction. In terms of the implementation, the management of the GTS was by the CHED regional offices and the national offices, uh, national office, also a first of its kind in this uh, round and PIDS provided support on questionnaire development, training, sampling design, and analysis. With the end in view that in the future round, CHED will be the one to do the entire GTS because it's the only institution with the proper motivation to conduct a policy-oriented GTS. So the data collection result, we were able to interview 11,000 doesn't point. 547 uh, graduates. So our response rate is 32.7%. So it's considered, it's low, but still within uh, global experience. So GTS are known to be, to have low response rates. So global experience is within 30 to 60%. And some of the regions with high 
response rates are region 1, uh, 9, 10, and 11. So per particularly NCR has a low response rate because some of the big HEIs here in NCR refuse to share uh, their in students' data. So most of the respondents were only, were only traced through Facebook or other social media platforms and through house to house because they only shared names and degree. So no address, no contact number. Yeah. So results, let's look at college experience. In terms of the programs that they graduated in, mo more than 70% of the graduates are concentrated in the top 15 courses. So there's few variation in the courses that they took. And there's also little variation between male and female uh, choices. So BS Nursing is the runaway winner. More than 20% took uh, BS Nursing. And then it's usually followed by education, business administration, um, information technology, criminal justice. Yeah. And in why they chose these degrees? They think that these are the degrees that will give them immediate employment and the most uh, ad promising career advancement options. Yeah. And just to take note that 20% of the graduates also said that they chose the CHED priority course, meaning they took the course that will get them the scholarship. And there's 17% who said that there was, they didn't have any choice at, not at all when they uh, entered college. So yes. So yeah, learner engagement. So we asked the graduates how, how, to what extent they had a sense of belonging to their university and were they, they did, do they felt uh, prepared for the study when they were just entering college. And those, the results are not too strong. So only around one fourth felt strongly about uh, having affinity with their university and being prepared for college. In terms of interactions, student life is mostly concentrated with uh, fulfilling academic requirements. So there's not much interaction outside school or outside school requirements. Not much interactions with students who are different from them, however they may have perceived that question. And yeah, so there's low partic participation in extracurricular activities all throughout. And then in terms of faculty, however, they are very set satisfied with their faculty across the board also. So the faculty gave clear explanation, made use of the time effectively, etc. So more than 70 to 80% gave the top two ratings for their faculty. In terms of the skills that they develop, they believe that their program developed working with others and learning independently the best. However, uh, they feel that they did not develop much their communication skills, critical thinking skills, and solving complex problem skills. So if you will um, notice, these are also the skills that the employers are saying that are the barriers why they cannot or they are not hiring fresh fresh graduates as much. So the students and the employers are are in agreement as to the barriers to employment with regard to these skills. Yeah. So when they were asked what should be added in their curriculum, they requested for communication courses. In terms of overall college experience, they believe that college life had the strongest effect on their personal and intellectual growth, but not much on translating what they learned in college into action and translating what they learned in college to real life situation. So they're not yet seeing the relevance of college life. 
So now we go to post-college experience. First is on employment. So these are job transition indicators. So how many months did they start looking for work after graduation? How many months did they look for work? And how many months did they start to work after graduation? So for total, for all the graduates, the mean months, so they started looking for work on average five months after graduation, but the median is zero. So the data is very widely dispersed. Graduates of pri private HEIs begin uh, job search a little bit later, 5.7 months versus 3.5. And they also look for jobs a little longer, 8.4 8 months versus 7.6 versus uh, compared to their public counterparts. So similar job transition for males and females. And of course, for courses with PRC requirement or the professional license exam requirement, they started looking for work six months after graduation and they were working around 15 months after graduation. So that's how long their dependency period is. Quite long, actually. With regards to field of study, so nursing graduates land on their first job 18 months after graduation on average. So that includes review, preparing for the exam, and then looking for work. So they looked for work on average 10 months. So if you think about it, they chose nursing because it's the one, they think it's the one that will give them immediate employment, but actually, they had to look for work for 10 months and they have to wait 18 months after graduation before being employed. So the ones with the short uh, transition from uh, college life to employment are graduates of journalism and, inform and information courses, social and behavioral, uh, which one? Uh, journalism information and agricultural, agriculture, forestry, and fishery courses. Nine months and nine months, respectively. Employment rates. So for the graduates, 86 out of 100 are in the labor force, and out of 86, 75 are employed. So we also showed here the results from the labor force survey, fourth quarter of 2014, which is the closest to our study period. So these are results for college graduates, 30 years old and below, to match our uh, survey respondents. So as you can see, the LFS and GTS results are close, similar. And I highlighted the regions that are that have high response rates. So these are the ones that you are you can be confident that the results are re regionally representative. Yeah. In terms of courses, the ones that are most employed or have high employment rates are secondary education graduates and accountancy graduates. So their labor force participation is around 90% and employment rate is also 90, 90 to 94%. In terms of the types of occupations that they're holding, 52% are professionals or associate professionals. There are more professionals in the public um, HEI graduates compared to private HEIs. And then among males and females, there are more females in, among professionals also and among clerical and support workers. So, sorry. So in the previous result, there was some interest on this elementary occupations. What are these jobs that are held by g college graduates? So we added a breakdown here. So they are usually cleaners or helpers or 
laborers. So some of our college graduates are holding this job, these jobs. The median wage is 460 pesos, and slightly higher for males. So, so the slightly higher wage for males stem from the fact there are that they are holding the better paying jobs. So when it comes to very specific job classification, for instance, uh, four digit pisok, they have the same uh, pay. But when you view it like this group, major groupings, it would appear that um, the males are earning higher. For instance, in service and sales workers, so the median pay for males is 538 versus 344 females. But within this group, the, the males are, usually, are mostly police workers, whereas the females are clerks. So in terms of addressing the wage gap, it's more of not the pay itself, but in making females uh, get the better paying jobs as well. So we did a little bit of investigation on education occupation matching. Oops. So some signs. So the graduates feel that they did not sufficiently yeah. develop communication, critical thinking, and problem solving skills, which we saw earlier. And then 70%, less than 70% think that their college degree is relevant to their first job. Less than half of them consider occupational skills, which we consider as proxy for what they learned in college, as the main reason for, land, for landing their first or current job. And then finally, uh, around a fourth of them think that outdated skills learned in college is keeping them from getting a good job. So these are fairly strong signs that the graduates feel that there is a mismatch. And to investigate further, we tried to compare their current occupation versus their baccalaureate program. So a horizontal mismatch, uh, horizontal matching, the appropriateness of the degree completed compared to their job. So the limitation of this exercise is that we don't have information regarding score skill, core skills learned that is of use to all possible uh, occupations. For instance, if my degree was nursing and I became a contact center um, agent with an account on antidepressant drug, is that a mismatch or a match? If I'm a political science graduate and I'm teaching history to grade school, is that a match or a mismatch? So to reduce the arbitrariness of that exercise, we focused on courses that have PRC requirement, those that require um, professional license requirement, which are the courses that typically have more defined matched occupations. So the result is that half, just half of the graduates with PRC required courses are in job, jobs that match their degree. So that's true for nursing and most other courses. So the course with the highest match is 65% BS Pharmacy. And the course with the least match is 4.2% BS Customs Administration. So there's only 4% of customs administration graduates that are working as customs officers. Customs officer, yes. Yeah, so just to give an idea about this 47.2 nursing graduates are working on jobs that do not match their degree, right? So what are these jobs here? So 11% are, con are contact center information clerks retail and wholesale trade managers, general office clerks. So general office clerks means, for instance, they are a receptionist in the hospital. So it's not a match because they are nursing graduate. So some are police officer, 
some are nursing associate professionals, some are shopkeepers, shop sales assistants, so maybe they are a sales assistant in a pharmacy. So still not a match. Some are teaching, some are data entry clerks. Yeah. So other aspects of post-college life, we now look at social political participation. Good citizenship is mostly associated with voting, obeying laws, and paying taxes. That's all. Mm, so they're not very uh, participating in social political association, serving in the military, and keeping watch on the actions of the government are not very salient for our graduates. But they do have a clear belief on what is ethical behavior. So most of them believe that these actions are not ethical. In terms of political and social actions, there's very low participation. There's also low participation in groups. So in terms of political and social actions, they're mostly doing charity, 47%, giving for a cause. And then in groups, they're mostly in church or other religious organizations. Overall life satisfaction. So graduates are most satisfied with their health and their homes. So they're still living with their parents and they're still young. <laughs> That's why they're satisfied. <laughs> But they are look for with their current job and employment opportunities. Of course, they are in the worst time when it comes to employment because they're just starting. They are not satisfied with, least satisfied with the national government and their financial situation. So least satisfaction with the national government, but very low participation in social and political action. Huh? Maybe, let's help them connect it. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. So lastly, we tried to relate college experience to post-college experience. So what we did here is to explore the extent to which college experience influence post-college outcomes. So earlier we saw the ratings, right, for learning engagement, faculty, and there are also some about um, services of the school, facilities, so we want to relate that with post-college outcomes which are on um, citizenship formation, overall life satisfaction. So those are several indicators that are given in ratings, right? You saw the bar charts. So in order for us to, be, to relate them, we need to summarize those information into scores or index scores. And we did um, principal component analysis to do that. So once we have the index scores, for instance, for learner engagement and overall life satisfaction, we run them on, uh, we run regressions on them. For instance, the outcome is um, overall life satisfaction. And on the excess, we added the college experience indices, faculty, um, learner engagement, support services, etc. And then we also added some student characteristics to see just the relationship. So it's a very um, crude way to see the relationship, but uh, we hope it's still informative. So for the regression of life satisfaction index on college experience, we see that Learner engagement and overall college experience have the largest effects on life satisfaction. So if, you, if the student was more active in his uh, college life, if he was joining more extracurricular activities, participating more in interaction with students, that is actually related to having better life satisfaction from this exercise. And then when rega when with, with regard to employment, we also see that learner engagement, support services, and overall college experience have significant effects on the odds of being employed. 
So actually, our um, college life has a huge impact on our post-college life, it turns out. Yep. So just to summarize the findings, graduates are concentrated in a few courses. College life is mostly focused on academic activities. Labor force participation and median wage are similar to LFS counterparts, and the females tend to hold the less paying job within occupation groups. Job education mismatch seems pervasive in the sense that um, the graduates and the employers are saying the same thing on what's keeping them from getting a good job. And to address this, it seems that it's not necessarily needed to add new courses, but more on to improve the method of instruction. Because you cannot have a course on critical uh, thinking, right? It's embed it's developed in you from the way that you from the way the teacher handles the course that's that lets you develop uh, these skills and communication skills yes there are courses on that but also in all your other courses you must incorporate developing communication skills right so it's not a um, mutually exclusive approach Social political life is not active. Their contribution to the public good is confined to vo voting, obeying laws, and paying taxes. Despite being concerned about their earnings and financial condition, overall life satisfaction is still high. So they're very optimistic <coughs> in a way. Positive college experience is strongly associated with private and public returns to higher education. So the better your college experience, the better you, your um, uh, employment outcomes and the better you contribute to political and social activities related. Some recommendation, it seems that the labor market information should be shared to students in the earlier stages of secondary education, even before senior high, to allow them to better assess among alternative career paths and their preferences. As you saw, among the top courses, only nursing and IT are actually the good paying ones. So the ones that they think are good paying are not actually good paying. So there's a gap in their choice and what's going on in the labor market. College instruction must be thoroughly improved in order to substantially develop communication, critical thinking and problem solving skills. As I said earlier, it's not necessarily adding courses, but improving the method of instruction. And then CHED and HEIs can formulate improvements to a student's college life that will have desirable effects beyond employment. So HEIs should promote extracurricular participation, extracurricular activities, student groups, interaction with different people. These are, these are turning out to be the important ones when you go out of uh, the school. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ms. Tutor. Our third speaker this afternoon is a development um, professional who has worked with government and development-oriented private organizations in the areas of education, financial inclusion, leadership, organizational development, and development research. She is currently a program analyst at the United Nations Development Program Philippines, overseeing a mix of government and private sector projects. She has degrees in economics from the Ateneo de Manila University and the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Karen Dominique Brillantes. Hello, good afternoon. So again, I'm Karen. I'm part, I was part of the um, research team that conducted this, the process evaluation of the senior high school implementation. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the background of the study, the methodology we used, um, show you some descriptive statistics, explain the logic model, and then the highlights of um, the findings and recommendations. Okay, so um, this study was conducted with NEDA and DepEd. Okay, so, so the study's objectives, first we, we um, looked at the program theory, we examined whether the program logic is plausible, whether it makes sense, and then we compared plans and actual implementation and tried to identify implementation challenges. We also assessed the intermediate outputs to determine if, they are, if the program is going um, in the right direction. And then we also try to identify promising interventions that can be um, that can be improved or scaled up and then interventions that, that will also help to improve the implementation. And we also try to find areas of the program that can be used for a future or for a possible impact evaluation. So just a brief background on um, senior high school implementation. So this is part of the landmark legislation of the previous administration. So Republic Act 10533 or the Enhanced Basic Education Act, better known as the K-12 law. So this was enacted in 2013, but the full implementation of the program happened only in 2016 with the rollout of senior high school. So one of the key features of the law is the senior high school. So it's one of the um, most talked about. So it, th during that time, it was very contentious. There were many groups that were opposing its implementation. But anyway, since it's a law, so it was implemented in 2016. So this is the structure of the basic education curriculum now. So elementary is from kinder to grades, grade six, and then we now have junior high school. So um, what used to be first to fourth year high school, so that's now junior high school from grade seven to 10. And so they had exploratory TLE or technology and livelihood education. And then fr um, from grades nine to 10, the kids now specialize um, in, a, in a TLE subject. In senior high school, so this is grades 11 and 12. So um, the senior high school program, it adds two years to, hi to the high school program. So now the entire basic education um, cycle is 12 years. Okay, so all senior high school students, they have eight core learning areas. So we can think of this as the general education, general education subjects in college. So uh, after they take the eight core learning areas, um, that have 21 subjects, they are to select a track, select one from four tracks. So these are the academic track, tech book, livelihood, sports, and arts and design. Under the academic track, there are, f there are six strands. So we need to remember the difference between the tracks and the strands. So under academic, so there's the GAS or the general academic strand, STEM, ABM, this is accountancy, <coughs> business, business management, humans, humanities, and then maritime. So one, two, three. So there are five lang pala. And then under tech book, there's home economics, agri-fishery, industrial arts, ICT, and TVL maritime also. So this is how our basic education is currently structured under the K-12 law. Okay, so for the methodology, um, our goal in doing our sa something was to capture was to select respondents that would allow us to capture a diverse range of experience, uh, of student experience. So we used the DepEd enrollment data for school year 2017 to 2018, and we did the random selection of schools based on several criteria. So we used the following categories. So based on school size, track offering, um, the area, urban or rural, senior high school type, and sector. So our additional um, considerations for the selection of our respondents were that the, the schools should be um, that, yeah, so the propor we took into account the proportion of the schools. So for example, the, there are many uh, schools offering, uh, there are many more schools in urban areas then there should be more sample schools from urban areas. So that was how they were chosen. And then all island clusters must be represented and then um, we, we specifically 
made sure that sports and arts, des arts and design schools are selected because there are only a few um, sports and arts and design schools. So after this random selection, we ended up going to these sites. So there were many uh, provinces in, in Luzon and Metro Manila also, and then those are the provinces in the Visayas and then Mindanao. So when we went to the sites, to the schools, so we talked to the school administrators, the school focal, the senior high school focal persons, because each school was supposed to have one. And then we talked, of course, to the teachers. So that's on the supply side. On the demand side, we talked to the students, to the grade, grade 11, grade 12 students, and their parents also. We also talked to um, the ed officials, so former brother Armin Luis Tros, uh, several undersecretaries, and bureau representatives, regional office representatives, and division office representatives. So those represented the different levels of implementation um, within DepEd. So this study is mostly um, qualitative. We used KIIs and FGDs, but we also did some computations using DepEd administrative data. And this was conducted from July to December of 2018. Okay, so the descriptive statistics will give us some idea of um, what the senior high school landscape looks like. It, so as of December 2017. So more than half or 58% of senior high school students are in deputed schools, so meaning public schools. So I'd like you to pay more attention on the orange block on the side. So it, it's a summary. Okay, so in terms of enrollment, so it's just the same. So for grades 11 and 12, so this is just the breakdown of the enrollment, but per grade level, um, more grade 11, grade 12 students are in DepEd schools. So the others are in private schools and state universities and, or local universities because uh, SUCs and LUCs also, there, there were SUCs and LUCs that also offered senior high school. In terms of enrollment by region and by sex, so and this, it's just reflective of population size. So most of the students are from Region 4A, both for grades 11 and grade 12. And more, there are more female students than male students. Okay, in terms of track and strand offerings, so what this table shows us is that most of the schools, so most of Dep Ed schools, public schools, Offer are offering just one strand. And then for Sucs and Lux, most offer two strands. So it's strands, not track. Okay, so it could be just the academic track, and then they're offering just one strand under the academic track. And then at most, so, so there are eight strands all in all, but there's just like 0.4% 0.4% of the total senior schools offering senior high school um, that offer only uh, seven out of the eight strands. And then most of them uh, offer GAS and TVL. So if you will remember, GAS is general academic strand. And then TVL, TechVoc. So it's those two are the most commonly offered, followed by ABM, Humes, and STEM. Um, for so for DepEd schools, TVL and GAS, for private, um, ABM and GAS. So SUCs and LUCs, they, they offer uh, a more varied strand. Uh, they, they offer more strands. Okay, so divisions with no schools offering tracks. So this table shows us that there are school, there are school divisions that don't offer some of the strands and tracks. Okay, so the numbers here on the side, they show us that ABM, only 1% one of the total divisions do not uh, offer that strand. Do you get it? It's quite tricky. So the numbers here, the percentages, show the number of schools that don't offer that strand. So for instance, maritime, 84%. Uh, so it's 84% there. That means that 84% of the divisions don't offer that strand. Yes, don't, don't offer the strand. So we can see that there's, there, there's a very small number of divisions offering that strand. So 
and ABM, so that's 1%, and Hume STEM, gas is 0.5%. It just means that those are the most offered, commonly offered strands. Okay, so now this, this table shows the number of schools. So kanina, divisions. This time, it's a number of schools. So just the same. Yeah, so maritime, 99% of schools not offering the strand. And then, but looking at the tracks, so TVL Sports, Arts, and ACAD, we will see that for sports and arts, 98% um, of the schools don't offer that strand. So those are the rarest, uh, but the, the, the most yeah, unavailable um, tracks. Okay. In terms of the, the distribution of um, students, so most are, there's a large concentration of students in the academic track and TVL track. So maybe because there are few schools offering the sports and arts track, so there's en enrollment in those schools are similarly low. Okay, so we will see in this graph, we see in this graph that um, the, the track enroll, enrollment to tracks is gendered. So some tracks are more female and others are more male. And we, we can, like, for, for instance, arts is more female, sports more male. So yes, so it's also gendered. Okay, then by strand, TVL and GAS have the large concentrations of students. Um, distribution of SHS enrollment by strand. Yeah, so in depend schools, so most are enrolled in TVL, GAS, and Humes. All right, so we already said this before, GAS is the most popular. In terms of completion rates, so th there's actually a um, high completion rate for the, sen for, for the first batch of senior high school. So data on SHS completers as of 2018. So, but the highest of all is among the TVL. No, the sports. Yeah, so sports and TVL have the highest rates of completion. That means um, students graduate at that rate. But in general, so at the national level, there's a 93.4% completion rate. So it's pretty high. Now we look at, so, so that's the senior high school landscape. So now we go to the logic model so, or the program theory. So of course, these are the inputs or the, uh, are what the project needs, the program needs to be implemented. And then the activities that were um, undertaken by DepEd. So they, prepare, they had to prepare the senior high school curriculum, the teaching materials, and then they had to recruit and train teachers. So there was, uh, there was a very large need for teachers during that time. And we'll see later on that, that, that that's actually one of, the, one, of areas of, one of the areas of concern. And then they also need, needed to build senior high schools senior high schools and then laboratories for schools for existing schools that are already that are offering senior high school procurement of equipment they had to advocate for the program because as we know um, there's opposition so they need to let people know what the, what the program is about what its benefits are and then they also needed to build partnerships because this is a nationwide program so the scope is very it's very big so um, Implement, the implementation needed more than just DepEd and the direct stakeholders, like the, like the students and the parents' participation. So the output, so the new curriculum, of course, we know that this was done, so there was, there's a new curriculum, the teaching materials, teachers recruited, facilities, tools, equipment, partnerships formed. So essentially, in the end, <coughs> in the end, we, all of these things, uh, the goal is to improve the basic education system. And, but for this evaluation, of course, it's not possible to evaluate whether the final outcomes are achieved. So we tried to look at the intermediate outcomes, what, what we have achieved so far. So these are just the accomplishments in terms of the 
um, of the outputs. But this was as of 2016, summer as of 2018. So for the budget, we see that until 2018, so it was increasing, but for, for, for last year, there was a slight decrease in the budget. And then for teachers, so there was a mass hiring of teachers and recruitment of teachers and also training. For the learning materials, we see that, so that's as of 2016, that means that was the year the progr senior high school was rolled out. So when it was rolled out, we'll see that um, there is still learning materials that have not been developed or we're still in the process of being developed. Okay, so classrooms were built, uh, facilities were also built, lab specifically laboratories and school heads were also trained. So these were the preparations that DepEd has done for the program. And the enrollment, so there were 1.4 million learners. So for 2016-2017, the following year, it's 2.7 million learners. So this is quite significant because during that time, so when we interviewed um, the former, rather Armin, so the former independent secretary, so they had this, this is an anecdote, no? so they had a board like counting how many were already enrolling because because they were facing backlash, right? Because of the program. So they wanted to see whether they would really meet the enrollment target. And so by the time that the classes, actually af even after uh, classes have officially started, students were still enrolling. And so they were able to, to hit. I think their target was only just 1 million, but 1.4 million learners enrolled during the first year of senior high school. And to them, that was actually quite, uh, an achievement. Okay, so 1.29 million of those learners um, were able to enroll through the ESC and the SHS voucher program. So th these are tuition assistances that, that DepEd has provided. And then transition rate, so this is the movement from grade 10 to grade 11. It's 93.3%. So this is also significant. This means that 93.3% of those who graduated from junior high school actually enrolled to senior high school. Okay, and then for the first batch of senior high school graduates, so this is 2018, based on the 2018 data, so 1.2 million graduated. So for this assessment, just like uh, what Dr. Orbeta presented earlier, we looked at program theory, service delivery and utilization and program <coughs> organization. We actually had so many findings that they won't fit in a 20 minute presentation when we were first presenting this. But we, in the interest of time, we're just summarizing the findings. So, well, the first is that, so this is a major program and um, based on the accounts of the former um, DepEd officials, this was a project that was really years in the making. People were really, different advocates, advocates from different groups were, have been working on this for a long time, but it was only in 2016 that this was um, signed into law. So it was a big program, a nationwide program, but DepEd was able to, to push through with the implementa implementation of senior high school. And we have to give credit to the DepEd bureaucracy for making it happen. So contrary to what what the normal people um, thought, DepEd was actually prepared. So they had, well, at least at the management or um, central office level. So they really had preparations, they had technical working groups, and they tried to organize themselves so that each area of the implementation would be um, taken care of. So in theory, Implementation was well planned. However, um, at the school level, so for some, for many reasons actually, that level of preparation failed to cascade. Uh, and some of the reasons are, for example, procurement. So one of the one of the many issues in implementation is that schools were not yet um, were not yet complete when um, classes started in 2016. And when we visited 
some of the schools, some of the sites, indeed, some classrooms or some school buildings were still being constructed, and that was in 20, 2018. So school's not yet finished, and many teachers, many respondents said that it was because of the procurement. Well, it's, it's mainly procurement. Um, it's mainly a procurement challenge. So the same with, in, with the equipment, school materials, many have not been delivered because of procurement issues. So with that level of preparation, people felt that the perception of several implementers, teachers, parents, students, was that DepEd was not prepared for, for senior high school. That's why there were ill feelings, Ill feelings towards the program. But not all of them actually were quite negative about the program. There were, because there was a, a wide um, range of experiences. So there were those whose schools were not as prepared as the others, but there were some schools where the entire school was um, complete with all the learning materials, teachers were, were well trained. So those schools, of course, had a good experience with the first year of senior high school implementation. So certainly the program's facing many challenges, but many of those challenges are related, based on our analysis, those are related to, of course, um, the, the beginning of a new program. So systems are still being set up. And so those are merely birth pains. So yeah, so, but those issues can be addressed. Uh, as implementation, just like what, what Sir Waves uh, said earlier, those can be addressed as soon as implementation pr procedures continue to stabilize and all the requirements, all the school requirements are delivered to them. So we don't know the status of, we, we're not really up to date as to the status of the, for example, delivery of the schools, but there's, during the time that we conducted the study, there, there was an and the element of ongoingness <laughs> of all the preparation. So yeah, building still being built and then um, learning materials still being developed. So these are the success factors. So I, I, I mentioned earlier that there were schools that had a good experience with the first year of implementation. And we saw that these were the main ingredients. So most of these are related to human resources. So teacher effort, quality of school leadership and management. So the principals, we met principals who were really proactive in searching for um, funds for their school. So both the teachers and principals where the DepEd could not provide what the school needs. So they tried to, to look for resources. They tried to build partnerships that could help them access um, additional resources for their, for their students. And then the quality of service rendered by the school's division's office. So of course, the schools needed help from the school's division's offices. So some of the SDOs are, were more um, proactive in assisting the schools. And they had their own programs that could also he help raise resources for the schools. And then, yeah, so the communication lines between, a good, commu good communication lines between the SDOs and school heads were, um, were important or was an important factor in the success of a school. And then the last one, I think this is, I personally think that this is one of the good things that uh, the senior high school implementation has brought about. So the strong partnerships that, that were formed with other stakeholders. And these include the LGUs, the communities and the industries. So there were some LGUs especially in the provinces, <coughs> who, who really cared about the senior high school. So when they knew that the school needed the building, so they would, um, they would look for sites where the school can, can build a school. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah, where <laughs> additional building can be put up. And then community also, so some would also pitch in their, some funds. So, yeah, for, for additional resources and industry. So partnerships with industry would come in for the immersion. So after the, so grade 12, after their academics, so they would have an immersion. So that's one of the components of the program. In the immersion, the students would have to, um, well, the schools needed to have, a, would need to have a partner 
industry. So for example, if the course or if the strand of the student is STEM, for instance, so some schools would partner with, although this is not a perfect example, but some schools would partner with the pharmacy, for instance. So kahit na STEM, kahit math yun, ang ano nila, ang immersion nila ay sa, let's say, pharmacy because that's the most closely related um, industry in the area. So schools would form those partnerships with industry. So for another example is, this one's a good example. So for example, in Laguna, so di ba may industrial area doon? Tapos yung mga students, so TVL sila, and then IT, ICT, yung strand nila. So the students would do their immersion in one of those um, ICT factories in Laguna. So, so that kind of relationship um, was strengthened because of the senior high school implementation. Okay, so this is what this is uh, among the schools that we visited. This is one of the of the few that stood out because of we consider this uh, a good the best practice well among the sites we visited. So this is the Kalbayog Arts and Design School of Eastern Visayas. So Kalbayog um, Kalbayog is in Samar. So it it's home to the former to the late director Chito Ronyo. So the art scene in Kalbayog is very much alive. So they thought that it would be good to have an arts and design school there. So parang yun yung magiging center sa Eastern Visayas, arts and design centers sa Eastern Visayas. So this is a school built in the middle of a Bukiran, Bukirin. So nasa, gilid siya ng, nasa gitna siya ng Bukid. And then, yeah, so it was established with the support of officials of the region. Yun nga, because it's region 8, that wanted to put up that school. So it, it was intended to be a, a regional school. So the LGU um, provides, because nasa bukad nga siya, so transportation was kind of challenging. So there, there were no transportation available actually, public transport, transportation. So the mayor provides, uh, there's, provides a jeep for the students. So like they meet up then sa city proper, may, may meet up time, pick up time. We meet sila, tas lahat sila sabay-sabay pupunta sa school. And then, may uwi and then, may time lang. So, pabalik naman ng city. So, that's being provided by the LGU, by the mayor for free for the students. And then, meron din na yun, cameras, musical instruments, because we know that yung mga media, um, communication and media equipment, those do not come cheap, right? So, dahil hindi nila hindi ma-afford ng school yun, so ang nag-provide na lang ay yung LGU. Yun. The principal is also proactive in forging partnerships, looking for um, partnerships. So, examples ng partnership nito, it's also for the immersion component of the program. So, naghahanap sila actively, saan, saan ba pwede mag-immersion yung mga students? And, yeah, and it, it was also a good thing that he's also an artist because he knows what the students need as an artist. And the teachers specialize and are trained in the art form they are teaching. We, we saw this as a good example, as a good practice, because one of the issues that were raised um, by the other respondents was that, especially by the students, was that the teachers were not really well versed in what they're teaching. So for example, um, kunwari, meron kasing sa humanities, may philosophy subject na yung mga students. Pero the teachers, because they're Wala namang, ano, wala namang um, Bachelor of Education in Secondary Education major in Philosophy. Wala namang ganun. So that means that the teachers, kumbaga parang their specializations are not aligned with what they're teaching. So the students notice that because of the quality of instruction that they're getting from their teachers. So in this school, uh, for example, dance yung subject. Yung teacher nila doon, Dance talaga yung, yung degree niya nung college. At saka talagang practicing siya. I mean, member siya ng dance troupe. Ganun. Or kunwari, drama. So talagang yung teacher nila ay theater. Um, theater, ano ba tawag sa kanya? So actor or actress. Ganun. So there's no mismatch. Kumbaga, dun sa subjects to end yung specialization of the teacher. 
And then the school also institutionalized a program regularly, inviting artists to the, to the school as resource persons. So this is part of, um, kumbaga parang in addition to what the curriculum provides, parang ito na yung extra steps ng, ng school to make sure na nabibeef up yung kung ano yung pinaprovide ng curriculum. Lalo na because hindi naman uh, based sa books yung learning ng mga arts and design students. Yun. Tapos they were able to identify relevant partners for the immersion. And their partners are not the like STEM pharmacy type of partnership, but yun, cultural center talaga, radio station, and other, uh, I think meron pa newspaper eh, because they also have students specializing in um, journalism. So, yeah, so this is one of the good schools that we visited. Okay, program gains. Yeah, as I mentioned, enrollment exceeded expectations. So there, there was a lot of negativity around the program, but people were uh, were delighted, uh, were pleasantly surprised that enrollment exceeded expectations. And then in some areas, so modular delivery is available. So para tong yung alternative learning program na. So hindi ka lang umatend every day sa school nung pumasok every day sa school ng student. So yung may ganung delivery, it has worked to bring back dropouts and potential dropouts to school. So the program was able to keep students in school. And then academically challenged but skilled students remain in school. So how? Um, we got this from the experience of TVL students. Kasi so normally, meron ka sa sila mga I don't know if it's cultural or parang, okay, TVL students, yung mga napupunta dyan, yung hindi masyadong, uh, based on what we got from them, ah, parang feeling nila, yung hindi masyadong academically inclined, napupunta sa TVL, kasi di ba yun yung, mas, yung, yung, yun nga, um, hands yung gagamitin, yung skills, ganyan. So those students, before, dahil hindi sila na-encourage pumasok because they're not good academically, now, naingan nyo silang pumasok sa school because nag excel sila dun sa inaaral nila sa tech book. That's where they're good at. And because of that, they're able to stay, uh, they're, they're able to remain in school. And then, the program has been able to mobilize different sectors for the implementation. So this is similar to what I discussed earlier na different stakeholders were able to come together to um, make this program happen. So, hmm. uh, in terms of the challenges, so uh, program, in terms of the theory of change or the program logic, I, we thought that DepEd was too optimistic about the adequacy of resources and maybe the systems, adequacy of the systems to deliver uh, the resources that the schools need. Uh, there was also, at the beginning, there was also a lack of program awareness and understanding in some areas despite the advocacy activities that were carried out by DepEd. So our recommendations were to make realistic assessments um, on the likelihood of delivery of program inputs. So it is schools, it is mga learning materials, equipment, and because most of the problems with the delivery of these inputs have had to do with the procurement processes, um, we, we recommend a review of the procurement systems, but then this might have to go beyond just DepEd because we know that it's a problem everywhere. So DepEd just ha has to continue program advocacy and dialogue with different stakeholders um, yet to improve their understanding of the program and to rally support. So from, from the perspective of teachers, so these are mostly from the perspective of teachers and students, and division offices. So the teachers express difficulties in delivering the curriculum because of insufficient guidelines. So kanina we said that at the management or uh, central office level, they felt that preparations were sufficient, but these failed to cascade to the, to the schools, right? And it's mainly because of insufficient guidelines, insufficient guidelines, inadequate materials, and preparation. So although there were trainings, syempre mass trainings yun because they had to be the trainings had, had to be done um, ng maramihan. So maybe the quality of the training suffered. Uh, and then, yeah, we know what happened to the materials. 
ayun, in terms of the guidelines, so those were not really clear for the teachers. So what happened was that there were different um, interpretations of what the guidelines were saying, and those resulted in different um, practices in schools, even in how to, in terms of how to deliver like a subject, whether it's going to be, for example, in practical research nila, they had practical research one and two, so paano siya per semester bayan or may mga ganong issues. That, so there was a misunder, there wasn't a clear understanding of those things because of the guidelines. And then the students expressed lack of choice in terms of tracks and strands due to supply side issues. So students were supposed to select their strands and tracks, their strands. But because of, uh, because they had no choice, many said that they had no choice. So for example, a school offering just ABM. So even though the students would like to specialize in STEM, for example, because that's their inclination, because the selection has to be, had to be, um, uh, ang tawag dito, parang aligned siya dapat sa interest ng student eh. Dahil nga may, may student choice. But because the strand limited was just, uh, the strand offered was limited to ABM. So wala na silang magawa. Yun na lang yung kukunin na lang um, strand. So varying extent of performance of program function. So this is more for the SDOs, for the schools division offices. So the differences in their, in the level of assistance rendered to the schools is mainly because there were some schools division offices that did not know they were supposed to support the schools. Or parang hindi nila alam ano yung level of support that they were supposed to give. So it also, it's also, it was also because of the differences in interpretation of the guidelines. Okay, so diverse program experiences among students from different schools in different areas. So yeah, our recommendations so there's a need to review the curriculum content. And when we were presenting all the results already, I think there was, also, there was already an ongoing review of the curriculum. So at least that's being addressed by DepEd. And then address the inadequacies in program inputs, especially teachers, learning resources, ensure the availability of all tracks and major strands, at least in the provincial and regional level. So, Earlier, we saw that there are divisions that do not offer all the tracks, right? And there are divisions that, that offer, di naman walang in-offer completely, pero like isang track lang out of the many. So you can imagine that maraming bata na hindi nakakapasok dun sa, sa, sa strands na gusto talaga nila. Okay, so work towards standardization where possible to minimize the diversity in students' program experience. And this would also help the teachers. So it will provide, I think that, we think that standardization would um, provide clarity you know, for the teachers as well. And then strengthen career guidance in schools. So um, career guidance is one of the important elements also of um, senior high school, but we found that many schools actually don't have um, strong, they don't have career guidance counselors actually, because in general, there's a lack of guidance counselors in the Philippines. So there's no career guidance function in many schools. Um, we also recommend a, a further assessment of the work immersion component. Because of the work immersion, so some schools, what, ha what would happen is that, okay, gumraduate na yung bata, tapos hinahire na sila nung kung saan sila nag-immersion. So yun yung we have, we had cases of students already, like pa pag-graduate na sila, tapos next ano hindi mo na sila magka college kasi they're going to work for for wherever they did their immersion so explore the possibility of supporting students in taking nc exams nc is national certification so i think sa sa tesda so after kasi ng ng tvl well this is mostly for tvl because sila yung kailangan magtake ng ng exam ng nc 2 Ganyan. Pero we found that um, NCE exams, well, they, had, they have to pay like 30,000 pesos pa nga yung iba, sabi 30,000. So, hindi afford ng students. So, students, of course, if they don't take the NC, then paano nila ma-apply yung natutunan nila sa TVL? So, it might be um, 
good to consider supporting students in taking the NC exam. So maybe provision of financial assistance to, to take the, the exam. Uh, and then uh, there's a note here that the issue of um, the lack of diversity of programs, of strands in schools, it is addressed by the joint development joint delivery voucher program so it's for TVL so kung walang TVL dun sa school nung nung student ang pwedeng gawin bibigyan siya ng voucher so that's like assistance financial assistance diba para makapag-enroll siya in another institution so that institution is not limited to school so pwede siyang for example pwede siyang industry partner na nag nagpo-provide ng training pwedeng ganun pwede rin na sa ibang schools yon So, that student, kung walang TVL dun sa school niya, pwede siya mag-apply, mag-enroll sa TVL ng another school offering the joint delivery voucher program. Yung may ganyang partnership. Okay, so, we also recommend addressing the issues related to the voucher program. So, merong issue ng, the issue of um, untimely release of the benefits of the voucher so that that was raised so i think we need to and the schools are complaining where the private schools because most of these schools are small schools relying on the voucher program so that's where they will get their operational funds so because the government is not DepEd is not able to release on time the vouchers then they suffer because they don't have any sustained operations that's why um they need to address this voucher program issue. And then, yes, yeah, so from the perspective of students, uh, of teachers, yeah, so we know that we've heard of this, teachers are complaining of so many administrative tasks that their quality of teaching is already suffering. So we heard that from senior high school teachers some also feel that the curricular content is too ambitious and designed to designed for advanced learners. So it, this is where they raised that. For instance, they have a pre-calculus subject. So it, it, for them, it felt that this subject is designed for schools for students of science high schools and not of the regular high schools. So there were those concerns. Yeah, so they had difficulty con contextualizing activities and this was worsened by lack of resources. So for examples, may mga examples daw sa, sa mga books na hindi nila ma-provide kasi wala naman silang resources para ipakita yun sa students. And then they also said that students were unprepared for senior high school material. So they had research subjects, but there were students who could not even, um, who could not even write a decent <coughs> English sentence so yeah so that's a problem that, that, that's the teacher's problems how do you make them write a research paper if they don't have the basics and then students different competency levels upon senior high school entry so yeah evident in computer liter, liter, literacy subjects and in private schools. so they have computer subjects ICT subjects in senior high school but not everyone na nanggaling sa junior high school, hindi lahat ay, hindi lahat ng schools may computers, hindi lahat ay nag-take ng ICT subjects. And their subjects are not the usual Microsoft Office subjects, but programming. So, ganun na yung pinag-aaralan nila ngayon sa computer subjects. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, they, they mentioned students' difficulties with research and performance tasks. Performance tasks, these are like the major um, submissions of the students from the perspective of students so many said that they experienced culture shock so because the environment was different for most so parang sa lang college and although yung age nila supposedly pang college naman na talaga pero they felt there was a difference and then they did mostly self study and reporting um Many mentioned that it might be because of the teacher's inadequate, well, unpreparedness, for instance, so that teachers made them report too much and the teachers did not give inputs. So, 
they felt that they teach more than teachers do. They had too many requirements also. Um, looking at the, at the curriculum, they had so many subjects than, than in the former um, curriculum. And they felt that because of that, their, their quality, the quality of their learning is sacrificed. So, nilagay namin sa box because we wanted to highlight yung sa arts and design and sports students. Because these students, so aside from doing their academics, they also need to prepare or to practice for their um, theater or dance or whatever arts ano, um, subject. And yung mga athletes, of course, they need to, to, to practice then. So on top of the regular academic workload. Um, yun. So in terms of difficult subjects, they mentioned na research. Ayun, research is one of the difficult subjects, philosophy and pre-calculus. Yeah, so for, arts, for the arts and design and sports students, it was important for them that they get exposed to different activities. So for example, kung art students ka, syempre important yung nagpa-perform ka. You're able to perform. If you're an artist, you're a painter, you're able to exhibit your work. Um, and kung ano ka naman, athlete ka, it's important for them to be able to compete. Kunwari sa palarong pambansa or other mga, ano, mga ganong competition. And not all of them are given opportunities to, to do these things. Yung kaninang ano natin, um, best practice na school sila. So they're, they're able to do, to give those opportunities for their students. Yeah, so they have this sentiment that teachers and other students look down on them because they feel like nasa arts and sports ka. So ibig sabihin siguro hindi ka matalino. Parang may ganong perception. So I guess it means that there's the understanding of why there's there are different tracks, hindi pa clear sa mga students and also sa teachers. So that's also one of the areas that um, DepEd has to work on. Okay, in terms of program organization, so there's a perceived confusion with program gu guidelines as mentioned earlier, and the need for better coordination with external partners. So for example, CHED and TESDA. Uh, so the coordination issues we, we found before, yung sa, sa CHED, um, so when students graduate, paano yun? Pwede ba silang, for example, gumraduate siya from TechVoc and the student decides to enroll in college. Pwede ba siya mag-enroll mag sa isang academic uh, subject? For example, psychology. So from, from sports, magsa-psychology ka. So there was an issue before na, ah, baka hindi pwede, kailangan pang mag-bridging mag -bridging subjects ng students kasi hindi nag-match yung what, what you learned in high school and yung requirement ng psychology. And it was an issue because the students had to shoulder the bridging subjects. So that had to be clarified before. And then in coordination with TESDA, the, uh, the teacher said that the curriculum for the, or the syllabus for, uh, for TVL and yung in-offer ng TESDA, parang may either may duplication or may, hindi nagmamatch, kumbaga parang may gap kasi hindi, na, hindi pala na-provide ng senior high school pero nire-require ng, ng TESDA. So, in terms of learning, hindi nagmamatch yung content ng curriculum. So, those um, had to be uh, ironed out with those agencies. And in general, one of, yeah, so human resources are inadequate. So, even though there was a mass hiring of teachers, still, um, they were, DepEd was lacking teachers, like guidance counselors and other school staff, actually. So apart from those challenges, there are more challenges. So I already mentioned the child policy on bridging, remedial subjects, the support to TVL graduates, and yeah, updating of teacher education. Well, I also mentioned it earlier that there's a mismatch between the teacher qualification, the specialization, and the subjects. So there might be a need for, for DepEd to talk to um, teacher education institutions so that they would be able to update their curriculum for teachers. Para makapag-develop makapag din sila ng program for teachers who will eventually teach philosophy or who will teach um, some other subject 
na, na wala naman before sa existing curriculum nila. Tapos, voucher program. Yeah, we already touched on this before. So, yeah, that, that's um, the implementation of senior high school. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Brillantes. We are down to our last speaker. She teaches at the College of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sci Sciences of the Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Maynila. She earned her bachelor's degree in education from the same school and has, do and has um, a double master's in literature and language from the University of Hawaii. She has done research studies with beads and has presented her research locally and um, internationally through full or partially funded scholarships from her school, the East-West Center, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts in Austria, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Netherlands, and the United States. Her research interests include assessment, language in, in, in education policy, and linguistic landscape. Friends, let's all welcome Ms. Jennifer Monhe. Good afternoon, Paul. <clears throat> Happy to round out today, uh, this afternoon's uh, presentations. So our paper is entitled Starting Where the Children Are, a Process Evaluation of the MTB Emily Imp Implementation in the Philippines. Um, here's um, structure of the presentation. I will do a little background because I understand we're uh, pressed for time. And then we also uh, will look at the process evaluation and then findings and discussion. So the big picture, so how pupils learn languages and how policy makers formulate language policies complicate educational outcomes. And then how teachers, administrators, and parents with their own individual linguistic biases understand and support language policies further complicate educational outcomes, right? So first, what is MTB MLE? So this is classroom instruction that begins in children's mother tongue and then gradually shifts toward national and or international languages as ch uh, children advance through primary education. Uh, but only after a solid literacy foundation is established in children's native language. This was from Jacob 2016. Um, from the DepEd, MTB MLE is defined as the effective use of more than two languages for literacy and instruction. So how is mother tongue um, defined? So I took from 1953 UNESCO's uh, 1953 definition that the mother tongue is that language that a person has been exposed to from birth or within the critical period, what one knows best, what one uses often, and and also is identified as a speaker of by the community. So why MTB MLE, right? So um, as you know, if uh, of course we know our language policy from 1901, it has always been, you know, English only and then bilingual. It was in 19, in 2009 when we had the MTB MLE. Um, through DO 74. So that kind of um, echoes the belief of UNESCO in 1953. They believe that learners, um, I mean, learning is best achieved by two short jumps. That is from illiteracy to literacy in the mother tongue and from literacy in the mother tongue to literacy in a second language. Then the one long jump of illiteracy to literacy in the second language. So what we, so the, we did a process evaluation of the MTB MLE program with Sir Orbeta, with Ma'am Chris um, Abrigo and Ma'am Capones, right? Sorry. So we also subscribe to this theory of change that th this, these are our output, uh, inputs um, of course, we have activities, output, preliminary outcomes, and the final outcomes that um, the, the program is supposed to have would be the following. For example, improved reading scores, improved comprehension tests, higher completion rates, less dropouts, etc., etc. 
So, but when we did the process evaluation, we adopted uh, DEPED's typology. So we selected um, samples from public and private, small, medium, large schools, urban and rural, and we uh, had additional classification of linguistically diverse contexts. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the um, following slides. So, okay, so this is ling linguistic diversity. So we define this as, uh, this refers to the number of languages present and the evenness of distribution of mother tongue speakers among languages in a given area. So we looked at the language diversity index, right? So the closer the index is to one, the linguistically diverse or multilingual the community is, and the closer the index is to zero, the less linguistically diverse monolingual or monolingual the community is. So we wanted to have a balance of uh, linguistically diverse and less linguistically diverse uh, communities because we, we sort of thought that uh, the diversity, the multilingual nature of communities will definitely impact the implementation of the MTB MLE. So we selected provinces from each island cluster of uh, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao by looking at their res respective LDIs. So we took it from this thinking machine data science based on a language diversity index per province enumerated in the language landscape of the Philippines in four maps. So, ang ginawa po namin, we, uh, we considered um, provinces with more than 0.5 uh, as classified as linguistically diverse contexts and less than that, LLDCs. So here's a um, visual illustration of the diversity, uh, language, uh, language diversity in the Philippines. So uh, the more colorful it is, uh, the more uh, diverse, right? So here's our sampling strategy. So we selected uh, from school size, there's one small in Luzon, Visayas in Mindanao, one medium in those regions as well, and one large from, I mean, sorry, island clusters. And also for LLDCs, we had the same for a total of 18 schools. So of course, um, 18 schools out of um, over 51,000 is very, is minuscule, but uh, we managed to um, support it with a survey. Okay, so been repeated. So I don't know if uh, this is okay to show, but here are our schools. So we used, we had four instruments. We used um, structured FGD or KII questionnaires. So it's supposed to generate data on program theory and rationale, service delivery and utilization challenges, and information on organization. We also collected um, data on number of children in school, length of residence of parents, subjects taught, le length of service of teachers and administrators, and highest educational attainment of teachers as well, and also length, uh, yeah, length of service and highest educational attainment. I'm sorry for the error there. We also conducted a little bit of um, classroom observation where we wanted to find out how how many languages are being used inside the classrooms, um, pupils' extent of participation. We're basically listening in on the, the subjects and we're listening to the students. And then we wanted to find, it, find out also whether or not textbooks are available or are being used, et cetera. Um, also, the online quick survey form. Um, this generated data on number of schools implementing and not implementing the MTB MLE, and we wanted to find out also the reasons for non-implementation. We, we wanted to find out also what languages are being used as uh, MTs, mother tongues, and also activities being done in specific localities. Right? Sorry, so a little bit of descriptive statistics here. So in, uh, there's a total of um, 270 participants <coughs> composed of 120 parents, 129 teachers, and 21 administrators uh, all over the Philippines. Okay, so 
this particular table, you would find um, <coughs> parents. So we selected the parents of uh, K to three because the MTV Emily only caters to kinder until grade three. So here are a few numbers. Okay, we wanted also to break them down in terms of uh, how many parents have one child, two children, etc. And then we also looked at uh, the teachers' um, educational attainment. So as you would, um, you would look at, uh, you'd find in these numbers, um, they cluster. A lot of our respondents, participants, have master's degree. They compose 64.3 percent of the total population. So this is the online quick survey. Um, we wanted to because we understand that. Only 18 schools were limited by the budget, so we can only go to 18 schools spread over the Philippines. So um, Sir Orbeta thought it would be best to have to collect um, survey via online. And um, we kind of succeeded because um, we have, we managed to get um, responses from 1,865 schools, that, that's of course really minuscule compared to over uh, the total of 51,147. But you'd find that there are certain regions that are very energetic in responding to our uh, study. For example, in Region 2 yeah, and uh, Region 4A. And there were also regions where there's zero participation. Okay, so the response rates, all right. Um, region one has the highest reporting rate of 59% and region nine with, uh, arm with 2.2%. Okay, so we found out the number of schools implementing the MTB MLE. So for example, so we, we asked them, are you implementing uh, the MTV MLE. So as you can see, the yes, um, we had 15, over 15,000, but there were also few that said they were, they're not implementing it. And that's both for both public, private uh, schools. Right, so what, are, what were the reasons why schools were not implementing the MTV MLE? So teachers lack relevant teaching materials. That's um, 18 percent, uh, the bulk of the responses. Of course, you also have school does not have the dictionary of the language, so they had problems with, um, with the mother tongues because they don't have the dictionary, they don't have the grammar book, etc. And um, there were also reports that the school does not get support from the central office, division office, so you have 2 percent. Okay, the MOI, what is the MOI? This is the medium of instruction <coughs> being used. So we found out that Tagalog is, uh, has 32%, so that's the MOI being used inside school, and is also the mother tongue of the students, followed by Cebuano. However, there were also these other, uh, there were many other uh, MOIs being employed in schools. So what's interesting for us was that we found out that there were as many as five MOIs being used by a particular school. Um, but of course, um, but it did come out in the online survey. Okay, so we wanted to find out also uh, whether schools have done the four minima, right, uh, which is crucial for the implementation of the MTB MLE. And um, of the responses, we found that only 9.1% of schools have the entire, have all four minima. So a good percent, 48, almost 49%, has done just one, so maybe ito yung big books. 
Okay, so the minimum activities done in the school implementing MTB MLE, writing big books was the most common. So you have 44%, that's, that's the easy, perhaps, uh, the easiest that they could do, followed by documenting the orthography of the language, documenting the grammar of the language, and um, yeah, and dictionary, coming up with a dictionary of the language. So summary. So the MTB MLE has sound pedagogical foundation and embodies the concept of a learner-centered learner -centered education. However, it is facing difficult implementation challenges and needs to find more effective, efficient, and acceptable ways of impl implementing the program. So for example, under program logic and plausibility, we found that there's a lack of common understanding and wrong appreciation of the basic rationale for the MTB MLE program. Um, some of the things that we picked up from the field was that um, the teachers were unhappy about the additional workload, and they were say, and they were also reflecting the uh, dupli sometimes duplication. Parang magtuturo sila ng, ng especially in Manila, magtuturo sila ng, ng Filipino, which is the mother tongue of many students, and then meron pang may Tagalog, so parang may, ganun, may, may duplication. So, the linguistic practices on the ground in terms of language use is far from presumed ideal. If uh, the idea of uh, the MTB MLE is that you begin with the language that's used by students, I mean, uh, by children, no? the, the, the language that they grew up with. In fact, there's not just one language. Sometimes there were several languages being spoken inside the house, right? And um, but the but the design of the MTB MLE is uh, has this only one mother tongue, to which is added the Filipino and the English. So yeah, that's it. The belief that there is only one MT per locality. Right, so even when regions are deemed monolingual, like for example in NCR, there were several schools where inside there are many languages because um, students come from all over the Philippines and of course they bring their languages with them. Uh, we also found out that outcomes of war brought displacement, language dispersion. So under program logic and plausibility, we recommended to clarify and disseminate the MTB MLE program theory to all stakeholders. Um, so this is really very important for the teachers, right? To, for them to understand um, why the shift to the mother tongue based multilingual education. Also to reassess the one MT per locality implementation policy. I, I think um, a few years, uh, yeah. Last, last year, DepEd is trying to address this already with the uh, language uh, mapping, right? They wanted to assess how many languages are being spoken so that they can address um, th that need. The theory needs to recognize the, that should be dialectal differences and provide clear guidance on implementing MTB MLE under these conditions. For example, um, we experienced in Samar, the, uh, like textbooks in Warai, um, some people would say, this is not our variety of Warai. This is different from what is being spoken here. So, but the students are all tested on that one variety. Yeah, so that of course brought, uh, is bringing about a lot of uh, dissatis dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Also step up information dissemination of empirical research <coughs> highlighting the efficacy of learning in the MD. Um, a cursory look at, you know, ResearchGate or Academia, I, ha I have been seeing that many teachers are already working on, on this, right? So it's only a matter of collecting all of them and then disseminating it to teachers just to uh, beef up, you know, the, the literature, the gains that can be made with using MTB, MLE as um, foundation for learning languages, for comprehension and the like. Also encourage knowledge generation of how children le learn many languages at once. For example, um, simultaneous bilingualism, which should inform, refine program theory and delivery of service. So the, the learning of, um, children's learning of, ma of many languages, especially in the Philippines, is really 
it's highly contentious, right? And, and as teachers, we should probably focus our attention on what exactly happens when <coughs> children learn languages. Not just one language, but uh, the language of the community as well. And then study the impact of social media on language acquisition and learning and see how best to harness these technological affordances. <coughs> Under service delivery and utilization, these are our findings. All elements of the program, um, sadly, had not been in place before the rollout of the program. Uh, we saw that there were many um, places where there weren't any textbooks, right? There weren't any books uh, that the teachers could use. And so sometimes their lessons were created on the fly, right? Or sometimes the teachers themselves would have to source out materials themselves and use that for teaching kids. Even before the rollout, serious threats to the program, such as lack threat of LMs, uh, competent teachers had been pointed out. There was also a case when, in a particular locality, um, some teachers do not speak the language of the community. Right. It was assumed that administrators and teachers would simply embrace the program because it came from above. So it, this is also one of those um, findings that there was a lot of um, pushback, if I am, might use that term, because, uh, because for, for, for me, reasons that have already been mentioned that it seems to be an additional workload and some of them are not competent, <coughs> etc. And then the MTB MED program implementation appears to be limited to public schools. Private schools have developed their own version of the program, which is to teach only the MTS, the MTS mother tongue as subject as well. And um, they feel that um, by not using the mother tongue of the community, it is their edge over public schools because they still maintain English as the mother tongue. Uh, as a mother tongue, really, of the, of the students, they, when we ask them what is their mother tongue, they would say English, because that's being spoken inside the house. And so they like the fact that private schools are not conforming to the MTB MLE. So what they do is they teach the um, mother tongue as a subject. So it's an, in a, an addition subject, additional subject to what they have. So our recommendations, step up the creation of localized indigenized, indigenized le learning materials that are quality prepared, reviewed, and constantly updated. Also, to continuously train teachers, whether new hires or veterans, in meaningful seminars. Regularly monitor and evaluate principals and teachers in implementing the MTB Emily program. Implement continuous advocacy work by regional MTB MED focal persons. We, we found out that there ought to be MTB MED focal persons, but it's not, uh, apply, it's not applicable to, to all schools. Some, some, don't have, some schools don't have uh, focal persons. Instill pride and value of languages by making them visible in the landscape of the school. Use mother tongue as a language of assessment in all content areas in K to three. So this idea of instilling pride. We've seen a lot of these um, schools na yung kanilang mga posters, it's in the mother tongue and that's good. However, we have actually encountered uh, one regional office na may malaking sign, uh, English only. So we still have that, uh, yeah, throwback from the last century. Sorry. Yes, and um, program organization, Findings, there are issues of procurement and the apparent lack of specific funding support for the MTB Emily related operational activities. So sometimes these um, activities had to compete for funding from the general MOOE of the schools. Also procurement issues have hampered the delivery of learning materials. Um, this is one of the more serious problems. Um, last last year, uh, early last year, there were still schools who were complaining that they don't have textbooks. Although the program has presumably been running since 2000, 
2009 at least sa DO and in 2012. So 2018 na, wala pa daw silang textbooks. Teachers for the most part are adequate in number, but some lack the necessary competence. Um, the schools solved this by encouraging these teachers to go back to their own region where they'd be uh, useful, I suppose. And uh, for some, especially in one region in Surigao, um, teachers are encouraged to learn the mother tongue of the community, even if they don't speak that as their MD. Coordination with other agencies and LGUs are varied. Um, there's a lot of support for MTB Emily uh, in certain places like in Zamboanga, right? The LGU is fully supportive of the MTB MLE. However, it's only for a particular language like Chavacano. And uh, the reason for that is, and when we pointed out that there are, there's a big population, for example, for Tausug speakers, uh, we were told that they didn't want to uh, promote um, uh, section, uh, section place, Chavacano lang, or dito, Tausug lang. So, pinu promote talaga yung Chavacano for the entire Zamboanga Peninsula. So, only a few schools have dedicated focal persons in schools that provide guidance by echoing seminars when there are seminars to echo. So, recommendation. Uh, designate a fund for MTB MLE operational activities. Institutionalize the use of language mapping to determine the MOI uh, for K-3 schools. I think the, the DEBED is already doing this. Strengthen dedicated MTB MLE focal person at the division level. <coughs> Strengthen synergy between division, district, and schools in terms of ba best practices. And enlist the help of local governments, particularly in funding the localization efforts. Because I think uh, when LGUs are told how they could be helpful, tumutulog naman sila. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ms. Monhe. Now we are ready for the open forum. But before that, may I request our speakers to please occupy uh, the seats in front. And also, may I request our um, audience to please um, state, the, state their names and uh, affiliations before asking the question. And if you can keep it short, okay? So we would like to ask the first question. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My name, my name is Merwin Salazar from the Standard Economic Planning Office. My question. Uh, I have questions for Dr. Orbeta and uh, Ms. Karen Brillantes. Um, for Dr. Orbeta, you have uh, presented uh, findings. Uh, your process evaluation uh, was focused on um, how far uh, was the uh, K-12 to program achieving its uh, intended uh, results in terms of access to education. And you also mentioned about uh, sustainability of the program in terms of financial support. So you, um, can you elaborate further on your findings, whether the program is financially uh, sustainable? Uh, and for Karen Brillantes, um, you have you presented the uh, logic model. Uh, may I know also this applies also to the study of uh, the, the study of K-12, uh, whether, uh, sorry, uh, of Dr. Urbeto, whether uh, the logic model, uh, the st stakeholders were consulted or participated in, in developing the, the program theory, or is it the, pr the, the study itself, the, the team who just developed the program theory? Uh, I'm asking the question because it has implications, <laughs> you know, the findings of the, of the study would have implications into the implementation of the programs. And also, um, I, the studies um, utilized foc uh, qualitative uh, methods such as uh, KIs and focus group discussions. Uh, how, were you able to, or how, do you, how did you validate the accuracy of the statements of the participants in the KI and, and, and the FGTs? And also, you mentioned about uh, uh, intermediate, uh, you, you were trying to assess. Uh, how far are we achieving uh, in terms of the intermediate outcomes? Um, but I, I did not see 
some uh, intermediate outcomes in, uh, related to learning. Uh, for, for instance, in the in the K to 12, uh, did how far are, are the students, you know, uh, progressing in terms of passing rate in the exams, for instance, or in the national exams? I didn't see that in the presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, Dr. Orbeta, would you like to answer first? Uh, let me. I think the sustainability that I mentioned was about sustainability of financing the uh, of the free tuition law, rather than uh, okay. So I th that was the uh, when the debate was uh, in the uh, in, in the Congress and Senate. The they were assured that uh, uh, we have no problems of money, but uh, we found out that they had to take money from basic education to finance free tuition. So if that is the case, uh, uh, well, I don't know next year do we have enough, uh, how, how long and, and as we, as the number of students increase because populations, can we support uh, that kind of expenditure in terms of, uh, so that's, that's basically, now uh, the problem if, if you can't do that, then, uh, then you will have issues about quality of the, of the of the uh, edu well, tertiary education going down because uh, we don't have enough money for it. that's that's the I think the our fears that so uh, we are crossing our fingers we hope that the uh, our legislators are true to their word that they will finance it but uh, we're not very much uh, hope uh, we're not uh, I should say uh, because given the uh, there are lots of demand on resources. And uh, as I've said, we already lost a lot of uh, resources by uh, by paying for people who have been paying before in, in, in state universities. That's already private contribution to tertiary education. And we said that we'll pay for that, don't pay for that. So that's, 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 so that's the, I think, the sustainability uh, uh, question that uh, I was mentioning. I was afraid, I, I, I'll be happy if it's sustainable, but by from the indication the first year already you uh, we have taken money from basic education to finance the you know, which is from an education perspective is a bad resource allocation you should never take edu money from basic education uh, because that's more where public uh, goods is greater uh, uh, and public goods in the tertiary education is much smaller than compared to basic education. So it, sh it should be the other way around. In your form. If you want to spend more money, it should be in basic education, not taking money from basic to tertiary education. So that's, that's the context of that comment. Uh, I hope we can continue this, but uh, uh, we'll see. That's, uh, do you want me to answer the other questions? Uh, yes, sir. There are f actually, there are four questions raised. Uh, yeah. uh, the accuracy, I think uh, if you, you're welcome to listen to the recordings of the, that we get from the interviews. That's the only accuracy that we can give you. So these are, uh, these are transcribed, these are recordings of all these conversations. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, for privacy purposes, we can tell you who they are. So that's, that's the, that's the, uh, what the other one? How are we faring in terms of the passing rates in national? And, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, we have some idea, but we cannot, we cannot have, uh, we cannot put it in paper because we're, nev we're never given uh, NAT scores. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, uh, uh, the, the only thing that we can do perhaps now is we can use PISA because that's available, but the NAT scores have never been officially given to us, so we cannot do uh, in analysis on that part. So the only thing that we can do is our enrollment rates and all of that. So until such time that we can get uh, hold of that, uh, then we can assess learning. Uh, hope, uh, hopefully in the next, few, uh, uh, next round we can, we can do that. But until maybe Senate can help us prod deep ed to give us the, 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 uh, the NAT scores. Okay. Yes, um, yes, sir. Dr. Pakeya. Congratulations to th this very um, comprehensive um, 
presentations. Uh, what, you know, in a sense, it's very complicated to digest because there's so many things being discussed at the same time. Uh, and you are describing and analyzing programs of reforms which I would characterize as the Big Bang's report, <coughs> reform, compared to step-by-step, by-step reform process, uh, like what Indonesia has followed and successfully. But my question, therefore, is this. Um, you have so many um, comments, so many recommendations. Uh, given what Dr. Orbeta has mentioned about constraints, and the constraints is not just financial constraint, but manpower constraint, those for the implementation, and knowledge constraint, information constraint, etc. And while I also agree that um, it's a good start, uh, these programs have good starts. My question is, moving forward, given these constraints, what are the highest priority, give me five, for example, that you're going to make sure that they are well-funded, that they are well-organized, will inform so that by the end of the Digong administration, we can say it's not just a good start, but actually we have achieved lift off sustainably. Who would you like that? Uh, who would you, from among them, any of them? So from among our speakers who would like to answer the question of Dr. Pakeo? Dr. Orbeta, okay. We start with Dr. Orbeta and uh, yes. I think the, uh, I've already mentioned uh, when we was asked, uh, what do we do given PISA results in the Senate this morning? So I said that uh, there are many things that we can do, but there's one thing that I'd like us to do, whichever we choose. Uh, my point is that uh, nobody knows, uh, there's no silver bullet for our problems. Uh, for those who know, you don't, uh, uh, bottom tayo sa trading second to the last science and math, okay? So that's, and people are concerned. So uh, the, uh, the question was, anong gagawin natin, essentially? So I said that, uh, my point is that we don't have a silver bullet. Uh, we have ideas. You always have a, uh, uh, like teacher education, uh, of course, pro uh, providing materials. But you know that you have always the devil of providing materials, is procurement issues, and all of that. And that's, this, that's what they're showing. So I'm, I'm, uh, my point is that the, at the principal level, we seem to have the basics of a good functioning education system. But we never really check whether those principles are translated or we never invest on checking. That's why you always bank that, oh, we have a good education system at the national level, but when we check with teachers, when we check with students, students complain. Nothing, uh, they don't. Uh, national level said the, the uh, curriculum guys are finished, but teachers say they don't have. So basically, so, you have a dis disconnect, uh, and nobody can tell which one is true. Why? Because we never really invested on checking what happens on the ground. So I think the only thing that, so whatever we choose, we always try to check what happens on the ground, because that's the only way we will know whether the principle works for our context or not. That's essentially my, my that's the essentially my, uh, the context of my, parody that we trust God, but everybody else should bring data. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's essentially the point, that we have to really check what happens. 
and very solidly and consistently so that we know if they, we have to achieve progress. We cannot talk at the general level. It's not somehow uh, there's little disagreement at the general level we should have. Uh, more autonomy for the schools, you train teachers, we provide materials and all of that. But did we really check if we have provided materials? Did we, what kind of teachers of, uh, what kind of training that these teachers are given? Is the curriculum really decongested or not? So we see a lot of these points uh, in, in the discussions. So those, those that's, I think uh, I have only one, so that's basically that. Whatever we do, please check what happens on the ground so that we will understand whether what, what we choose has worked or not. And really be, be pinned down that uh, that's, that has happened, uh, that, that we achieve what we are supposed to achieve, essentially. So that's the, that's the there are other things. Uh, I'll leave that to Dr. Pakeo to provide, but uh, that's, that's essentially my, my major point. That, uh, we, should, uh, we should not just uh, say that we did this, but we should check whether what we did produced supposedly the, uh, the outcome that uh, they, are they are supposed to, 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 to produce. So that's, that's my, we should invest in that because that's the only way that we will know that we have done something. Otherwise, we just talk at the level of concepts, essentially. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Orbeta. Would like to hear um, the insights of the other authors. Would like to go for, yes, so Ms. Tutor. Just in relation to Dr. Orbeta's point on checking what's happening on the ground, we can also take advantage of what the others have found out, the other countries that have done reforms on the education sector. So remember, last year, our Nobel laureates in economics are have done lots of research on education and they have some solid findings, for instance. Um, what works in improving learning is teaching at the student's level. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't quite matter how complicated or how simple your curriculum is. What matters is the students learn with us other students that are the same level when it comes to understanding, when it comes to their learning. So it um, remedial, lessons work very much in improving their test scores. So they also have uh, several results on how to improve teacher instruction, how to improve attendance participation rates in school, so we can take advantage of those global results in education sector reforms when we try to do our own, to supplement our findings from the ground. Thank you, Ms. Tutor. Let's hear from Ms. Brillantes. Um, so you probably have better ideas on how to how to improve the system, but um, well, my response will be um, based on what I've heard from the teachers. So I guess it's and it's quite related to what um, Ms. Tutor and Dr. Urbeta said. So I think the process of learning within depth ed maybe it's not really happening, and partly because we don't have data to really to really know what's happening. So, in that learning process of whether what they're doing is working or not, they'd be able to capture that by talking to the teachers. So, because we've been hearing that lagging um, top down yung approach. So, parang teachers feel that they're really just following um, the memorandum orders, all those circulars coming from the central office. So they're just followers. So, but they have, of course, they know what's happening on the ground. And maybe um, that information does not reach those in the central office. Or maybe the information does reach them, but there's really no systematic way of reaching them and um, processing that information so that it would become useful for them in terms of planning or developing policies that would be implemented um, depth wide. So I guess, yeah, so maybe they could make learning um, really a part of their, of how they work as an organization. And in that process, they need to listen to those who really 
who are on the ground, who are working on the ground. Thank so, you, Ms. Karen. Ms. Monhe, any insight? Um, if there's one thing we did very, very well in the last 10 years, it's, it's the implementation of the MTB MLE. Um, the issue of language gets to the heart of comprehension. And we have never actually addressed it uh, until the 074, except that um, over time we've been seeing how sectors are proposing going back to English because we are, um, our proficiency in English is really going down. But of course it will take time because uh, we've been learning English for over 100 years and we have not been paying attention to our mother tongue. And so this is the kind of fruits that we are already reaping because we have not paid attention to mother tongue. So uh, I, I'm not so sure I would like to use um, Dr. Arbed as um, silver bullet. Uh, I don't think mother tongue is going to be the silver bullet, but I think it's going to be one of those things that could help improve um, Philippine education. Because with a mother tongue uh, education, there's access provided to students whose mother tongues are not Tagalog or English. So by, by constant, continuously supporting it, by sinking more money into it, I think, um, I think we will be reaping the results of what we're doing in many years, to maybe in 20 years' time. Be because we're, we have to dial back the effect of um, the language shift that has happened the last 100 years. So the reason why we didn't have any textbooks on Kinamayo or Ivatans because we have shifted to, to English already. So we failed to develop our mother tongues. That's why the initiative of DepEd to focus on the mother tongue is really laudable. And so it needs a lot of uh, support from the government, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Monhe. Um, for the third question, yes, sir, at the back. Good afternoon. I'm Ronald Reyes uh, from the Committee on Basic Education and Culture at the House of Representatives. I would like to thank you for the very useful research outputs, but most especially for the research of Ms. Monhe, because right now, the uh, Committee on Basic Education is in a quandary about the use of the mother tongue. A lot of the legislators are blaming the poor performance of the PISA to the use of mother tongue. And so most of our members in the committee, especially my chair, chairperson, Ms. Uh, Congressman Roman Romulo, is filing a bill and they want to pass it before the session ends to suspend temporarily the use of mother tongue. Until there is, there is a certification from the Commission on Wikang Filipino and from the DepEd that there is sufficient learning materials because we've learned that out of the 130 languages in the country, there, um, the available learning materials are, are only for about 19. So the legislators are thinking that the, the children will be suffering from the confusion that is caused by the use of mother tongue. And so I think if we're about to deliberate on, the, on these bills, and so we're trying to ask from you if this is the right course of action that we should take. Ms. Monhe, your response, please. So uh, personally, I think that is going to be the most, uh, that's going to be the saddest decision <laughs> that could come from that committee because um, it's really unrealistic to start looking at gains already at this early stage. It's barely... Um, 10 years and like what I said we'll, we have to dial back the over 100 years that we've been using English and we have not developed our mother tongues and yet the mother tongues are alive in the mouths of children and uh, it's really going it's really a challenge right to, to suspend I mean it's going to be a challenge to to uh, the use of the mother tongues because there's a lot of opposition, there's a lot of linguistic biases, not only by the teachers but also by the parents as well. And we've seen that on the field, we've documented that. Um, but may momentum na kasi yung mother tongue, it's starting to become embraced, it's starting to become, um, I mean, a lot of parents are saying, mas uh, participative na ang anak ko kasi they're using the mother tongue. This is the language that the child speaks inside the house. and 
and which uh, that person is very much uh, competent in. So if you suspend that and go back to bilingual, I'm assuming, so we'd be back where we started. It's as though the 074 never happened. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Arbeta. Yeah, I think the uh, one of the things that should be clarified is that PISA is never, uh, PISA results never because of mother tongue. You remember PISA is for 15 years old. And uh, the one that has been taught in mother tongue, actually what we are saying is that the program has never really been implemented uh, as, as designed, as you already mentioned. Uh, schools have uh, uh, implemented it the way they want it. Only less than 10% have the required four uh, requisites. So I don't even want to recommend that the program should be evaluated because the program has never been implemented. It's just a very, very poor uh, version of what should be. Remembering that, so that, and uh, to say that that's, that's, that's the PISA result is because of the mother tongue is really kind of uh, very far-fetched. One, the one's tested are 15 years old. Never gone to the pro program if you go strictly. So these are not the, so PISA, we, we, our scores in PISA is because of other things, not, not, not because of the MTBLE program. The, I think the program is facing a lot of challenges and a lot of clarification issues that has to be understood by people. Uh, so there is a, uh, until and unless we are, we, inter we uh, implement that the way it was designed, we cannot say that the mother tongue never worked because it was never implemented in the first place. So that's, 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 the, that's I think, what the study is saying. It's been implemented in some way, like in, like in private schools who implement it as a subject, which is funny because, like, for example, in private school, just to be saying that they're implementing ma the mother tongue, the, the, uh, the added uh, mother tongue subject. What's the mother tongue subject in Bulacan? It's Tagalog. How is that different from Filipino, which is a required subject? So they have already two sub subjects, a mother tongue, which is in Tagalog. So basically, that's how schools interpret it. So it, that's, that's the, that they say their implementation of mother tongue, which is very far from the, origi from the design. The design is supposed to be medium of instruction. But the, the assumption of the program is that there's only one mother tongue for a child. But who, who, there are only very few kids who have only one mother tongue. What happens if your father is Tagalog, mm -hmm. your mother is Bisaya, mm -hmm. and you're living in Tacloban? Three languages already. Anong mother tongue ng bata? That has to be resolved. The program assumes that there's only one mother tongue for the child. Ano bang ginagamit ng bata? It has to be resolved. How you deal with that kind of language diversity of a kid? Hindi pa kasama yung, ano tawag doon? Language ng mga sa text. Where's Jill? Jill yan. So those kinds of things. There are a lot of influences and we don't really know. We just leave it to the school to decide what medium instructions to use. Uh, assuming that they are given support, but we find out that most of these schools are not even given support. So what kind of, what implementation are we talking about in terms of mother tongue? It's just a law implemented in different, however the schools will, 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 uh, uh, will versions, just, you have several versions of mother tongue implementation. So that's not implemented the way that supposedly it was designed by, by the by DO. So that's, that's one thing that we should be realizing. We, it doesn't mean that there is, an, uh, uh, that's one thing that I realize about when doing this research. People don't follow the law and they don't get, and they don't, uh, they're not imprisoned. Just like uh, they don't follow the mother tongue law, nobody gets in prison. So, so basically, be, because they're implemented the way they implement the law. So that's, that's, that's the, that's the, so having a law doesn't mean that we have implemented the concept behind the law. We have to understand what actually, how people interpret the, like some, even if you have a clear department order, the way it's implemented in the school may be different, but they never really check that. So that, that's, that's, that's what happens. So we said that we have implemented it because we have a department order. Uh, just check 
what's how it's how is the department order implemented in the school and you will know wh and decide whether that department order has been implemented or not that's very common in many thank you so much dr orbeta yes doc, uh, mr agustin thank you uh, i'm dan agustin agricultural sector of uh, the land bank of the philippines uh, let me just uh, ask questions on the context of uh, education. And uh, one of these is the PDP, our uh, Philippine Development Plan. To Dr. Orbeta, uh, I think uh, if we are to focus education, we relate it to the PDP and, uh, and uh, because we are in policy, PIDS is in policy. What policy should we adopt in order that our educational sector would be in tune with the PDP. And uh, to Dr. Chutar, Mom Chutar, uh, very excellent findings. Um, uh, sad that uh, all the courses, uh, agriculture belongs to the uh, lowest choice, considering that uh, we need agricultural people. Uh, for a country considering that one third of our population is in the rural areas. Now, uh, Secretary Dar, Secretary Lopez, I've talked to them personally, and they're promoting agripreneurship because our agriculture is underperforming. What policies uh, would you recommend? so that uh, our young people will be enticed to go back to agriculture and probably promote this uh, trust of Secretary Lopez, Secretary Dar, to develop further our agriculture. And uh, to M Madame de Brillantes, I've got a brilliant uh, study likewise, all of you. Uh, when the K-12 was being the conceptualized, the context was competitiveness, to be the Philippines to be competitive with our neighbors. Now, the trust now is the so-called 4.0, or industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. What policies should we adopt in order that our K-12 would be in tuned uh, in creating this 4.0 objective? And uh, a light question to Madame Monhe. Uh, Monhe, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we need a mother tongue uh, because, you know, uh, I'm in agriculture. We have so many PhDs in agriculture. If you go to Los Baños, a lot of studies, but these studies cannot be understood by our farmers. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a gap between theory and uh, practice. Would you recommend a language similar to that of Yorme Esco so that it can be understood? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Agustin. Let's start with Ms. Monhe. <laughs> what language would you uh, prescribe or recommend? I, I don't think I am in any position to prescribe <laughs> any language. I think, uh, but sir, you made a very valid point that uh, none of the, the things that have been discovered by many learned scientists actually trickle down to the people who would benefit, potentially benefit from this, and uh, um, maybe require our academicians to write in their mother tongue, maybe. So actually we have seen, I have seen so something similar. So many of our poets and artists, when they create 
they do so in their mother tongue, in Tagalog, and in English. Probably we can do the same things with uh, our research outputs. For example, if it's going to be consumed by uh, people from Leyte, maybe they can translate into the language so that it will really impact the lives of people who would potentially benefit from findings in agriculture. I hope I, I answered your question, sir. Thank you, Ms. Monge, Ms. Brillantes. What uh, policies would you recommend to attune the K-12 to, to the fire or the fourth industrial revolution? Um, I think that um, the K-12 system is already, um, well, positioned to contribute to, well, to enhance the student skills so that they could um, compete in the fourth industrial revolution. Because one of the things that it aims to do is to equip the students with 21st century skills. So, and these include um, information literacy, media literacy, technology literacy. So these things, and I think um, these are the skills that would be needed uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. So it's really just maybe making sure that the curriculum is able to, that that curriculum um, teaching these skills is really um, translated into actual, I don't know, maybe the teachers are able to teach these through the curriculum. Thank you, uh, Ms. Berliandes, and for Ms. Tutor. Yes, so how do we entice students to study agriculture? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and agripreneurship is now the new term. I guess um, for a policy, I, I, I would recommend that we tremendously increase our research budget for agriculture <coughs> research and development. Because yes, you can entice students to study agriculture with scholarship, but then they would be thinking, what is, it, what is it after this? What can I really do after being given the degree? And of course, you don't expect them to physically farm. Only some of them can be absorbed in the academe. And what's very fruitful for improving agriculture is really research and development, which funding-wise is non-existent for the Philippines, except for traditional sectors like rice, carabao, and that's it. So hopefully we won't have senators who are degrading research in agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and again, for improving agriculture, we need, uh, we need to address the major gap in agricultural productivity for the farmers, which is financing. Even land bank financing for the farmers is a very small amount of what the farmers actually need. So we need to beef that up. Yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tutor. Uh, Dr. Orbeta, please. I think the study, uh, the, uh, the recommendations of the paper uh, on, on higher education is really uh, at the always the, the development plans is about uh, promoting equity and efficiency in, in, in education. So uh, I think one, two recommendations, if I remember correctly, of the paper was really to uh, one to be open to redesign of the subsidy. We the, the way it's uh, we are afraid that the subsidy now will will uh, uh, cause a deterioration in the equity of 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 access of poor students. Uh, the promise is the TAS, but it's 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 uh, it's uh, uh, facing a lot of targeting issues. So if if you can target well, then maybe the TES can 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 solve that. Uh, so that's that's one. Uh, in so uh, uh, making it making the program uh, uh, true to the promise of uh, giving access to lesser uh, to poorer segments of the population. Okay, that's that's for the equity. For the efficiency side, that we already said that. Uh, we should use the subsidy to promote uh, quality. You already have problems with the quality of our tertiary education. That's why uh, 
uh, we, I'm very much concerned about sustainability of the program because if you cannot sustain the level of expenditure in the quality of our tertiary education will even deteriorate, even more deteriorate, it's already low. So that's, 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 the, that's the, uh, our, uh, our fears. And uh, of course, uh, it, uh, we'll see in the next few years uh, uh, if that, that, that happens. So I hope that uh, the, we're not encouraged by the first year experience of getting a large amount of money from basic education to finance free tuition. That's, that's, that's the basically, and if that's the way you finance this one, then you have, you have a lot of problems. And uh, so those, those two things are basically uh, the, the main, that if you continue and, and, and hope we can regain the private contribution to tertiary education, which was in the form of tuition before, which now governments want to pay. That's already a voluntary contribution of private households into ter their tertiary education. We hope we can regain that and add to what the result of government to spending more in tertiary education and not, uh, by not taking from the basic education and, and making that fund uh, promote quality in, in, in tertiary education. That's, 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 the, that's the essential nature of our recommendation that uh, whatever government uh, spends, it should be able to promote those two things giving access to poor households and promote uh, efficiency or quality in, in tertiary education, which is already suffering, not uh, torpedo the two. Like for example, if you cannot sustain it, then, uh, then uh, you already reduce the, uh, potentially reduce the access to poor households and as well as uh, not uh, uh, contribute to the deterioration of tertiary education just because you cannot sustain the promised expenditure which you lost already because people, private sector is willing to s contribute, you said that no, don't pay, we will pay, the government will pay for it. So that's, 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 that's I think, the major argument that you are s saying. Uh, we have to show performance on those two things, equity of access for poor households and efficiency in terms of uh, promoting quality in tertiary education. Thank you so much, Dr. Orbeta. Since uh, we are already beyond our, uh, our schedule, let me read to you a question or the last question, which is from a netizen, okay? um, Mr. Philip Pernell. Uh, the purpose of all educational reforms is to improve learning of students. Inputs and processes are only as important as they promote or hinder learning. So are the K-12 reforms improving learning progress and learning outcomes of students or not? And why, why not? And then there's a follow-up question from him. Do we know what happened to the almost 200,000 learners who either drop out of after the year 10 or year 11? So any from the panel can uh, answer or respond, respond to that. Would you like to go first, Dr. Urbeta? As, uh, we, as I've said, uh, at least we are, we, uh, we are more open in terms of the test scores. We can, no one can really, no one can really, no one can really say anything about learning, learning outcomes. We, what we, uh, I hope the uh, DepEd will, will share. As I've said, we spend a lot of money on not scores and don't share it. Uh, what's that? Uh, for, for analysis or use it for analysis for, for schools to learn what's happening to the students. That's the only way we can, uh, you have to have uh, standardized tests uh, so that you can compare performance of schools. So I, I, th this is, I think it's not uh, 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 peanuts money to spend in the nation nationwide tests. But why is it not released and for public uh, assessment and all of that so they can, we can see. And, 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 and so that's, 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 no, that's one of our, we cannot, uh, unless of course you have money to do your test your own, which most researchers like PIDS don't have. Uh, so uh, we rely on, uh, uh, this test released uh, so that we can do an, an analysis of it and, and, and give some insights from, 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 from those. Uh, I don't know about, what's it, 200,000? 200,000. <coughs> what? Drop out. Ah, okay, we, 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 we don't, uh, actually we are in the process of uh, this, uh, this, is the, this is the second 
uh, senior high school study that we did. The first one was uh, on uh, labor market. The, sec the sequel to that is actually looking at the 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 uh, the what do you call this? The labor market data of uh, of of uh, on what actually where the senior high school students. This is the third study. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, where the senior high school student. Uh, how did we perform the labor market using labor force survey? Hopefully, we'll have some answer to that. I don't know uh, if we can get that, but we will try to see uh, what happened to the senior high school graduates, uh, senior high school graduates uh, in the labor market. Those who choose not to go to college yet. Uh, so that's that's the that's our uh, uh, next study. Hopefully, we'll be able to get the results by the end of the year. In Birba, so that's that. So that's that's the one. I I don't. Uh, uh, I hope we can have data on that's that's our problem with 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 not uh, uh, having a good many system for for the programs. We don't. Uh, we can only argue uh, in theory, mm -hmm. never in 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 data. So that's basically. You know, so we can always argue forever in theory, but. Nothing happens because we don't know what actually happens. Thank you so much, Dr. Orbeta. Any other inputs from the group? Okay. So thank you so much, Mr. Philip Pernell. And before we conclude, let us take another question from the, 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 the lady at the back who's been raising her hand. I'm so sorry I didn't see you. Okay. Uh, hello. I'm... Marife Bakate, I'm not affiliated with any organization or institution, hello, uh, but um, I was a former mm, consultant for the Chad Unifast, so my comment and maybe some questions is related to the study on Unifast. Ah, free tuition law. I, I learned too late that this is being televised, so <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, one, uh, I'm sorry, I'm still very, because I'm very impassioned when it comes to this. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a bit confused why it's still being called uh, the free tuition law, because it's kind of misleading until now. Um, at first, I thought what's being assessed is the free tuition of 2017, when in fact it's the universal access to tertiary, uh, universal access to quality tertiary education. Um, I think it's about time that people know it with those four programs instead of just free tuition. Um, the other one is, um, what you call this? Um, the, uh, <coughs> hmm. With regards to the, uh, it says here that, um, gosh, there's a lot. So the targeting system of the uh, DES, uh, when it says targeting mechanism, I hope na it's not about the targeting system per se, which is the listahanan and, uh, and other additional provisions provided in the IRR wherein they could add, you know, lists because that's the SWD. If we're talking about Chad Unifast implementing the DES, I think the focus would be more on how they make use of the listahanan of the DSW or the targeting system of the DSWD so it is much properly with uh, whatever they are collecting from the different universities. So it's more of the actually matching. So I agree that it's the identification, like the information we get, and then how they match it. The block box there is the matching part. Um, the other one that uh, I have a comment on is, uh, sorry, um, there's not much, um, I think, a mention on the support system that was supposed to be provided in the implementation of the four programs um, that that was supposed to ensure quality one is the provision of career guidance um, what has the you know what has the institution done for that the other one is the harmonization of these programs with other existing financial assistance um, it was, I remember it was uh, not clear back then and how did they you know, resolve 
because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, other implementing institutions, I mean, financial assistance implementing institutions and agencies were also confused, and uh, and the universities with their own financial assistance, like how do they? Uh, so that one, and um, the other one is the question on um, how did they uh, resolve the issue about quality on students being qualified for this assistance. The idea there is we want to ensure that if you provide this assistance to incoming students, they'd eventually complete, otherwise you waste government money. So there was supposed to be quality control even for the incoming. The career guidance was supposed to be the quality control to ensure that they complete and they get into programs that are eventually relevant. So. I'm not sure if they were able to put that in place in the first year of implementation or the transition. And the other one is um, the alignment of the guidelines with the IRR and the consistency of the IRR provisions with the law. I think that's, um, that could have been in the logic and part. And how did the policymakers understood this consistency and alignment. Um, there are others, but um, for the moment, <laughs> that's all I can think. Oh, the other thing is um, um, the how readily available are the guidelines in a way that is actually easily understood to the stakeholders, especially to the university and the students. Yeah. And the last, uh, this is really the last one, please, I hope I remember. Oh, um, is, it, um, is it clear to UNIFAST that they were not supposed to be the implementers of the free higher education? The implementers of the free higher education are the SUCs and the LUCs. Um, the UNIFAST and CHED were only the transition, transition, were only the holder of the funds during the transition period. But eventually, the funds were supposed to go directly to the SECs and L U uh, to the SECs. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, the transitory period was supposed to be the period wherein Unifas Ted was to gather information about the universities and their fees and their funding that would allow them to propose budget for those uh, for the free higher education for each individual at SEC so they could go directly to that Kaa so they can do away with the additional burden of them becoming the dispersing agent, when actually those funds can just go directly to the SUCs. So, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Mikate. Um, Dr. Orbeta, would you like to answer or respond to the questions? I think i like to call it free tuition law because TES was, big, was to appease the private sector. It was originally a free tuition, free tuition law. I would suppose. It was when the private sector complained, they created the TES. That's, uh, so it's uh, personal preference for me that that was the original intention. And uh, even the idea of funding the Tibet so that you'll not have, uh, 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 you'll not have the, what you call this, you'll not have uh, preference for higher education than Tibet was, we forced that because they said you can't have a free tuition uh, or tertiary education and not also pay for the tuition for because you're preferring for college over Tibet. So that's, that was the idea of, of uh, so I, I uh, maybe it's a matter of habit I call it free tuition because we, I fought tooth and nail against that law. Uh, uh, we lost, but uh, that's essentially the, the the point. So we are uh, what the study was all about. How do we make it? Uh, uh, how we can we take it? I, I think the 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 idea of uh, sector pernia was can we take it in such a way that it will promote uh, the objectives of the education sector? We already have the law, so basically. Uh, so that's 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 the that's the that's the antecedent of that. But I think I, I mentioned the real name of the law, right? Mm -hmm. I just call it free tuition out of habit. 
uh, because I was there in the debate, you know, during, even from the previous law. Dr. Pakeo was even almost, <laughs> uh, what's he called this? Sanctioned in Congress because of these statements. Uh, so that's, that's essentially the, uh, uh, so, I, but the, 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 the title of the study is, is the, is, is universal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just meant, you should just get the way I, I mentioned it, but the title of the study is, is much more uh, the way I describe it. Uh, I, I, I don't think we, uh, one of the things that we failed is that we didn't, we didn't have time to get into the, I think one of the issues that should be looked at is what happened to the 8 billion that has been given to Tibet. Nobody has really looked at that because you know, Tibet only handles program of the size like two, one, two billion in terms of uh, training. Now they get three, six times of that, but nobody has really looked at how it's implemented. So that's, that's, that's an issue uh, for me. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think the, uh, that, that should be oh, an important thing to look at because that's a lot of money, uh, education money, training money. And, uh, I don't, uh, we didn't, we didn't have uh, the, I think the, the first year of the implementation of the program was really about, uh, uh, there was no problem with uh, implementation with SUCs because it's, 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 it's easy. It's just a uh, transfer to, to, to uh, transfer to, uh, Issues, but the problem was in the TES. Remember, those are forty percent of money is in free tuition. Forty percent is in uh, TES, and that because it requires it requires targeting, it complicates the issue. So that's that's one of the. So there was an issue. Uh, there was a. Uh, I think the the back and forth between Ched at uh, Unifast and and. Uh, and uh, the schools is give us uh, all your poor piece, uh, uh, all students who are poor piece, uh, children of poor piece, the first cut. Okay, of course, that's, that's, then there's, there's too few of them. So give us all, uh, so I think some of the schools submitted all their students uh, and let uh, Ched determine which ones are eligible. So that created a lot of problems. And there was, as I said, there, uh, in the end, they cannot, uh, they cannot consume all the, there are a lot more, 200, I, I, I forgot the, 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 the amount, uh, it's already like August, and they have not yet identified the number of students that, is, that, that can be financed by the program because of the, uh, I don't know, Marifim was a little bit more about problems with the matching of the names of submitted by the schools and uh, Listahanan, for instance, that does that. Uh, I, we, we, have, we never had an uh, idea of what happened to the support programs. Uh, uh, the, the only th for the quality, I think the, w we, we asked them about how do you maintain that, uh, the quality of the university, uh, given the influx of the, um, the, of the applications. We just said that we, we, Make sure that all of them pass the entrance examinations. So that was uh, that was the that was the reply. Uh, I think the law has, uh, if I remember correctly, I don't know if you remember. There should be a national examinations, uh, uh, some kind of qualifying examination. So you have to pass that to get the subsidy. So that's 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 uh, that, that that's not been implemented yet. Uh, so and. Uh, I don't have to comment on the consistency of the IRR and the law. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, by in the, uh, how really, uh, we already mentioned that the, the guidelines were too late for some schools that created a problem with reimbursements and all of that. So that's basically the, the, uh, the so it gives you an idea that uh, the guidelines perhaps were not fixed at the beginning of the, it was evolving, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, uh, 
and the whether that's the Unifas is as not as an implementer of the program. So uh, that, that's a, uh, uh, I, I, I see the point of the that uh, if you just direct direct the uh, go directly to the I think the Unifas was there uh, in the original design of the Unifas. It was an, supposed to be an institution who will orchestrate all student financial assistance program from, from scholarships to, to uh, grants in aid and, and loans. That was the original design of the UNIFAS. So it ba basically it's an allocation system, okay? Uh, of how much money should be given to all of these three financing. Uh, and uh, that was the, I think, the idea of, uh, of that, of the, of the of the institution, uh, we wanted, and of course there is is this uh, still far off loan system that we have to develop, but that has not been developed. So I, I have no problems with going with the pro um, <laughs> Maybe that's not correct way to say it. Uh, when you give the money directly to SUC, what do you mean? Uh, they will just they will just uh, how do how do how do you how do you allocate? Do you, if you have UP should get, let's say, 100 slots or all that, and that kind of <coughs> decision has to be made. And I think we thought that if there's a national body who will allocate how many should be in scholarship, how many should be in grants in aid, uh, and how many should be in, in, in loans, that should be an independent of, of the system. So basically it's like, if you want to promote uh, science, you provide more money for scholarship. If you want to promote uh, access for people who are not really poor, you put more money on the loans, essentially. So this, there is a resource allocation uh, function that has to be done in ag aggregate scale. That was the design of why there was a UNIFAS. Never, of course, that to think that they will be distributing the money, but the resource allocation has to be done at a national scale. I think that was the idea, uh, yeah. Vic, yeah, Vic has been part of this discussion from uh, the 2012, I think. Yeah, the, the main difference between the original uh, Unifast and this universal free tuition uh, law is essentially that um, unlike in the original, you, you give money directly to the issue C, okay, it's tied. While it's in the original, you provide, the government provides what we call the portable subsidy, meaning that subsidy follows students. It's like more or less the TES, except that it was for all. In other words, issue Cs will have to compete for the students and the students are free to go Issues is anywhere else provided they meet certain standards, those colleges and universities. And the students qualify. So it was, in a sense, uh, unlike what we have now, which is universal, that one is essentially for all who can do a good job in college and complete. So they have to take an examination system. Thank you, Dr. Pakeyo, for uh, that input. So I think everything has been covered. And um, unless uh, the other speakers or the other um, presenters would like to share their ideas. No more. Okay. So uh, I think that concludes our... Uh, okay. Meron ka pang sasabihin, sir? Yes, sure. <laughs> Finally, okay. Yes. Oh, um, so thank you everyone for your active participation and of course to the insights and the time of our, um, our speakers. Uh, but before we let you go, may we request you to please fill up the evaluation forms given to you earlier and uh, uh, when you're done, kindly leave them to the secretariat. Also, 